Oh, hey, what's going on, everybody? Welcome to the middle of nowhere. And you might ask yourself, what am I doing out here? And why would I be doing an intro from here? And the reality is, I forgot to record the intro to this episode when I was at the studio doing other work. So here we are recording it out in the middle of nowhere. But fortunately, we live in a time where you can do things like that. So let's get right into it. Today's episode is brought to you by Black Rifle Coffee. And why don't we just go and look at what is on their mobile offerings, since most of the time I'm looking at this from a desktop. And you know what I'm finding? If you go to blackrifle.com, blackriflecoffee.com, they have a Black Friday sale that's going on right now, which I highly recommend you get into. It's the largest product drop of the year. So 100 new releases right now. There's a free gift with the purchase of two coffees, and there are the 30 Presents Out, which is a bag of collaborations, it may be. Actually, no, it doesn't look like a collaboration. It's just a new bag of 30 Presents Out. You scroll down, you're going to get that same rotating bar that lets you go between light and extra dark coffees, so you can figure out what it is that you like, and then right back into the stuff that I always talk about, the apparel, the gear, the coffee bundles, coffee sampler, bestsellers, all of those things can be found, purchased right here from the convenience of your mobile phone. It's a great time that we are living in right now. Let's get on to my guest for today. His name is Taylor Duckett, and I wanted to bring him on for a few reasons. One, I often get emails from people saying, hey, well, how come you don't have somebody on who's just a regular guy or gal? Does it always have to be somebody with a background or an experience in this particular area? Or are you willing to just sit down and talk with everyday people? Now, for clarity, I am an average everyday person. Um, athletically, intellectually, actually on that one, an argument could be made for average, if not a little bit below. It'd be tough for me to, to defend. But I'm an average person. And I love sitting down and talking with people. And I don't care what their background is. Now, the second and I think the most important reason was I have talked a lot with people who have had profoundly positive and impactful benefits with psychedelics, whether it's Amber and Marcus Capone from Vets or just people who have gone down and sought treatment and really had a huge impact in their life. And I truly believe that it is groundbreaking and can have an amazing impact. But even when I listen to people like Joe, who brings on experts and they talk about these things, the one thing that I think is left a little bit in the shadows are the potential negative consequences of psychedelics. Because nothing is perfect and nothing is without consequence and nothing is without risk. So Taylor reached out to me blindly and said, hey, would you be interested in talking to somebody, and paraphrasing here, and he speaks for himself in the episode, of somebody who broke their brain with psychedelics and the uphill battle and the time that it took for them to get themselves back. And of course my answer was, absolutely, let's do this. So that's kind of what today's episode is about. I'm not trying to paint a negative light in any way when it comes to the use of psychedelics. I have zero experience and I talk about that and my, uh, I guess my fear or hesitation around it in the episode itself. But this is the other side of that coin. So episode, I don't even know what number it is, with Taylor Duckett. Enjoy. Okay, got the red smoke. Gun run, north and south, west of the smoke, west of the smoke. Okay, copy, west of the smoke. I'm looking at danger close now. Oh, what a minute, give it to me, I need it. You're cleared hot. Captain, cleared hot. Taylor, what's up, dude? Not much, man. How the hell do we find ourselves here? So, first <laughs> podcast... <laughs> First ever? podcast ever. Yeah. Me too. Yeah. So it's fine. Well, it's going to be a journey of exploration together. <laughs> no, man. I wrote you. Um, we should. Do- why? Was that two two months ago? I have no idea. I think it was two months ago. I wrote you. Um, you messaged me on Instagram. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I shot you a message. Let's not church it up and be like you were <laughs> penning a letter in the eighteen hundreds with a feather. <laughs> no. So just like uh, on a whim. Um, on my lunch break, I, I had been thinking and writing a book. I mean, I don't know what qualifies as saying writing a book. Can you say you're writing a book if your goal is to write a book and you're four pages in? Yeah. Okay. I think starting then the process. I'm writing a book. <laughs> what got you wanting to do that? Um, so the book is going to be about my experiences with, and I already know friends are just going to be cracking up. So they all know I did psychedelics back in high school. 
and the running joke is that it was a bad trip, but I have like the ha ha funny version that you tell over beers around a campfire, like yeah, ha ha, bad trip, did mushrooms. Um, but what they didn't know is that essentially it broke my brain for four years, and I dealt with like major depression. Um, social anxiety, all that kind of stuff, low self-esteem, um, you name it for like four years, dealt with it in private, didn't tell a soul. Um, t- first two years was kind of like this. I mean, just, just living day by day. And then eventually I started just seeing like an up curve where I was like, Hmm, I think I'm kind of getting better. Um, from things I was doing, um, eventually after about four years, I kind of realized, Oh, I think I'm actually starting to do good now like i'm starting to actually feel okay to the point where i'd say by 2012 i felt good again and how old were you at that point i was 17 so f- from 17 to 21 you were on that journey yep so at 17 um called a deep dive into psychedelics did a giant dose of mushrooms that led into some other stuff um typical drinking smoking weed in high school um and yeah it it rocked me so the reason that I wanted you to come out is I'm very aware that I've had a bunch of people on who I've had vets on who have had great experiences through, I guess one of them. And I won't, and I won't say his name because I don't know how open he was about it. One was kind of a self administered. He described it as a heroic dose of mushrooms to kind of reset. That's the term I was going to use for my first experience with psychedelics at 17. So I know nothing about it with zero Mm -hmm. experience. I'm going to say that's probably a bad idea, but we'll get to that. Oh yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Oh yeah. (laughs) So I've had, I've had friends on and I have seen incredible, incredible impact, I guess would be the word all for, for all of them actually except for one. And I've talking kind of at length, my buddy Dave, who ended up killing himself Mm -hmm. and he, fuck. He seems like he really tried. He was Mm -hmm. consistently going back. And I think, I mean, who can put anybody truly in somebody else's headspace, but I think he saw the impact it was having for other people and kept repeating it, but it just, it didn't sink in for him. Yeah. I never had the chance to talk to him about that or tell that portion of the story. I've had people on who like Marcus and Amber Capone for Mm -hmm. vets, all of the things that I have, people that I've talked about, it's through the lens of look at this amazing impact it's had on my life. And one thing yeah. uh, I would consider, you know, Joe to be a friend. He's got a massive platform, but nine times out of ten, if not ten times out of ten, when he's talking about mushrooms or five meo DMT, it's all through the lens of this amazing experiences. Mm-hmm. And I just don't think that's a complete picture. So when you reached out, that's why I'm here. When you reached out, I couldn't think uh, I, with any conversation. There's two sides. Mm -hmm. Everybody wants to focus on this, you know, it's this amazing medicine that is changing people's lives, which I don't doubt that it is. I think it is too. But it's painting with a broom. Yep. So, yeah, as soon as you reached out, like, absolutely. So, yeah, I mean, this is an exercise for me in leaning into discomfort. I mean, I've never talked on a podcast. I've never, until one month ago, nobody knew what I just told you just now. Nobody in my life. Not even your wife? No. So my wife was the first person to know a little detail just to tell her, hey, I've dealt with a little bit of depression, anxiety. And that was to get her through postpartum issues with our first son. Yeah. And it helped tremendously when she realized that because I I mean, it was in a pretty deep place for a while. Just realizing that she wasn't alone in somebody I who had see dealt it. with that. Yeah. The thing with having it and knowing that is you can see it everywhere. Yeah. Like, I mean, I'm hyper aware to people who have issues. I have empathy for it. Um, I try to help people. I'm genuinely a pretty outgoing, happy, glass half full dude. You're not a psychic, are you? No. I don't believe in any of that shit. Do you read people's palms? No. (laughs) What did your radar tell you about Michael when you came in? Gaydar? Is that what you (laughs) You can use whatever term you like. That's what hits for me, too. (laughs) I ping highest on the Gaydar. (laughs) You sunk my battleship. (laughs) Well, no, that's the other thing with the, the psychedelics is a lot of people come out woo-woo and hippie with it. I went deep into it. I don't have any kind of thoughts about it like most people want to do it. Like, I'm, I didn't come out of it a... I mean, maybe at one point I wanted to be like a like a Aubrey Marcus type character when I was in high school. Like, that probably was where I was at. Is there enough room on this earth for two of those, though? No. Not as far as I can see. He has... <laughs> 
swan dived <laughs> into the pool of whatever he would describe it is that he is doing. Dude, like mine was purely just, it went from like partying to, okay, now I'm starting to get a little bit of an ego because I'm having fun in high school. We're going to parties to, oh, let's smoke some weed. Oh, I let's try this now. And I just remember being like, I think it was probably like Apatow movies where I first saw mushrooms and I was like, oh, that looks cool. Like, let's experience it. Um, and I went out of my way to experience it, not knowing anything. I mean, we're talking 2007. There wasn't social media. I mean, we had a MySpace, but that was like, even MySpace was in its infancy in 2007. Um, well, where were you growing up? Take, talk me before we get into the experience that you had, paint a picture of uh, kind of where you grew up and what you're up to. Yeah. So I'll go broad as just a little town in Northern California. Um, where at? Um, near Redding. Okay. Do you know where Redding? California yeah. Is? I lived up yeah, yeah. the farthest North I ever lived was Sebastopol. Oh, okay. Yeah. By San yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So up there, um, little small town. Um, and for people listening, that's extremely North in California. Yeah. We're not, talking not two like and a half as, hours yeah. North of Sacramento. Yep. Closer not, to the Oregon border than. Yeah. I was going to say. Yeah. Yeah. It's a little different than LA, San Diego area. Yeah. What isn't though? <laughs> that's true you know it, I, what is there probably 35 million people now living in the greater la san diego yeah. area yeah it's um i just got back from new york i didn't realize how much i appreciate where we are now mm-hmm. right I, I appreciate more when i go on trips like that mm-hmm. i couldn't do it no I, I could not do it no i'm i can understand how people go from massive city to smaller city having done that i I think I might rather be homeless than go live in a city of that size. I don't even like going to Sacramento. I mean, I start yeah. getting into more than three lanes of traffic, and I'm like, I'm good. I don't, <laughs> I don't need to go to a city with that many people. Yeah, Sacramento's huge. Um, so, but like you, I mean, you just touched on a ton of stuff I, w- I wanted to say and what I've been thinking about. So, like, I'm a big fan of Rogan as well. <coughs> I've always, I mean, I've been a fan of Rogan since 2014. I mean, I. Almost, I listen to probably eight out of ten episodes. I'm a big fan of just podcasts in general. I have a job where it allows me to listen to podcasts a lot. I love hearing high level achievers talk about what they've done to do it. Yeah. Um, what do you do? I am a sales support for a um, called a lumber company. I'm going to try to keep stuff broad. I don't want to go too. Yeah, just give us the website yeah, yeah. address or like the street address. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I work in an inside sales like supporting role um, for outside salespeople for a lumber company for people that would consider themselves to be morons like Mm -hmm. myself what the fuck does that mean so we have our what is it you actually do (laughs) so you have our outside sales force they're actually talking to customers doing things like Uh, on the um, we'll use home depot not that i'm saying you but in that setting people come to where you work and they're out there dealing with them or contractors yeah so our outside sales force are selling our products by communicating directly with dealers we only sell to like to order. Okay. Um, we don't sell custom to any, anybody else. Um, so they deal with them. They put in a order. I help them make sure that order is exactly how it needs to be to go okay. into production. And I work directly with our production engineers drafting. Okay. Just basically just as a funnel, like conduit between our outside sales force and our production. Makes sense. Um, in a cubicle. So downtime, I mean, not downtime, but when I'm doing busy work, I can have an earbud in so I can have a podcast in driving to from work. Um, so I've always just loved podcasts. I used to travel and do service work for us. So I'd service van, travel around people's homes, working in their homes. So I was on the road a lot listening to podcasts. Do you so, remember the first one you ever listened to? Yeah. First one I ever listened to was the, uh, what was the one about the guy who murdered, murdered, uh, like a girlfriend. It was like, uh, it was a super famous podcast about a murder story. It was like one of the first big ones I remember hearing about. And it was everywhere. Do you remember who the host was? I don't remember the host, but I remember the dude's name was like Adnan, Adnan or something. Oh, Michael. Yeah. <laughs> so just about to And go. the first time I heard somebody say, oh, do you listen to podcasts? I was on a job site and that dude was literally like doing something on the job site and I was checking out the house and he goes, hey man, you ever listen to podcasts? I'm like, that button on my iPhone? No, I have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> and he's like, you should listen to this. And it was... I was a late adopter also. Yeah, yeah. Very late. <laughs> I had never listened to a podcast before I was on Joe's the first time, yeah. Yeah. which may have changed some of my answers, but I don't think I would have changed it. That was answers. the first time I had heard of you was on that episode. Like, that's how long I've listened to When I was on with Tate? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah we had a little discussion about what should be done with people in Guantanamo Bay. Yeah. 
What'd you find, Michael? Ad, uh, Adnan Sied. So what was the name of that podcast? Uh, I think it was, uh, let's see, Serial? Yeah. Yeah, it was called S- Serial. S- so much nicer having him in here <laughs> being able to do this. For years, I did everything by myself, and he would edit afterwards. I would just take the footage and yeah. give it to him. Holy cow, the difference to be able to pull something oh, up bet. and talk about it in real time. Are you going to start calling him a young Michael? Or is that no. taken by Joe can Jamie. do his, his own thing. <laughs> uh, Jamie's not that young. That's why I've he seen. has long gray hair. Yeah, let's call him like somebody called uh, Tiny when they're giant. <laughs> I'm gonna call Jamie mid. He's mid Jamie, midway through his journey. Yeah, um, which I think is that an insult, Michael? It, it now, you're my, nowadays you're my, mid is an insult. Yeah, I touch yeah. in with him to get uh, the the pulse of the modern generation. So I, mid is pejorative. What's the new thing to cap? I've heard cap. I don't cap. that one. I know. I don't know. Cap and bussin. What is cap? Cap means bullshit. <laughs> Like that was cap. So people now people will say if somebody says cap, you're calling bullshit on somebody. If they say something to oh. you like, "Hey, no cap," that means like no bullshit. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Again, this is why I check in <laughs> with the younger generation here. It's nice because <clears throat> nope. I can say what. <laughs> but what you were touched on, you said like, yeah, Rogan has people on about psychedelics. It's usually positive. I give Rogan credit though. He usually goes, "Hey." Probably not everybody should do them. At some point, he used to say, I think everybody in the world should do mushrooms and it would probably be a better place. He's also changed his stance pretty rapidly, not rapidly, uh, drastically about weed. Really? He, for a long period of time, he was just super pro mm-hmm. marijuana. And for, for I could give a shit how people choose to live their life. Just make, just understand every choice you make has consequences. Mm-hmm. I, I don't know what changed his mind. He's more cautious in the way that he talks about it. I think yeah. maybe he's just more aware of the potential after effects or side I think effects. He mu- I think he probably knows some people who had something happen. Probably. And people also, I think, make the mistake of using him. They'll say, well, there's nobody out there who can use THC products and be super high achieving or productive, mm-hmm. which I have no idea the actual volume that he uses. He's pretty open about it. He is very high achieving and high functioning, yeah. but he also probably is the anomaly. Oh, yeah. Outlier for sure. Yeah. If I were to consume that much THC, getting to the couch might be monumental, let alone getting off of it at some point. So you don't do psychedelics. Have you messed around with THC? Yeah. 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 I mean, it's uh, um, I the not from a recreational perspective. Mm -hmm. So for me, sleep has been generally difficult. <clears throat> and before I get in this, I'm not trying to do an ad for Glover's uh, supplements, but he has a line called Wolf 21. Mm-hmm. And he has there's two products. One of them is Bed Down, I believe it is. And it's it's a – I'm going to fuck up this word. Cannabinoid? Cannab- cannabinoid. Cannabinoid, but mm-hmm. it's CBN-based. And it's like point zero zero zero. Very – it's not a THC, but that thing puts me down. And then he made another one, and I think each gummy has I think five – milligrams if that's the right terminology for and every once in a while i'll take one of those because i find that it helps with like soreness yeah and it i god i sleep so well but it's not something i do like i don't take that in the morning and be like hey let's go on a ride throughout yeah. the day straight for sleep i don't recreationally smoke because it's so hard i don't like ingesting stuff into my lungs yeah like this cough i have had for three weeks it is the bane of my existence but like i grew up in santa cruz california don't get me wrong i'm no stranger to weed or smoking <laughs> weed um but at this point like i just value my sobriety yeah you know so yeah. i can be functioning and do the stuff that i want to do i mean i don't do any other than a drink yeah um, many drinks i mean i'll still like tie one on good every now and then but i, will occasionally I don't too. Yeah. i don't mess with anything other than that yeah been there done that even when i was past my experience and i smoked some weed i was like nah this doesn't doesn't do it for me puts me down alcohol's an upper that thing just puts me to sleep so i've just i don't I've think alcohol I've is an upper i think it's a central so, nervous system depressant so yeah it is it Feels like an upper to me. Like yeah. it puts me in a better mood. Yeah. Just kind of heightened sense. How about the next day? Depends on how much you drink. Yeah. I think that's where a lot of the central nervous system hit comes mm-hmm. is the following day. Yeah, because you can have a couple drinks and you find the you find yourself in the pocket and you're oh, like, yeah. this is amazing. We're gonna do this forever. You get out of that pocket and you're like, I'm gonna go to sleep right now. <laughs> <laughs> um, so with the the Rogan saying that stuff, you've had people on talking about it. And I, yep. So that's where it comes from. So 
All of them that I have add on, and, and the, again, one of the reasons why I responded the way that I did is I'm very cognizant of the fact it's one mm-hmm. side of the story. Yeah. And I, I'm at a point where I've been knocking off some like bucket list stuff of just really applying discipline to things I want to achieve. And I thought, why not? If, I, if I've been sitting here for five years hearing Rogan talk about this stuff, you've had people on talking about it. I keep waiting for somebody to be like, well, this could happen. Yeah. And I finally was like, you know what? If nobody else is going to do it, maybe I should just suck it up and see if maybe that could be me. And so that's just an exercise in, yeah, getting out of my comfort zone. Maybe I could be the face of that for a podcast just to let people know. I love your podcast for how much into the mental health side you have been going into. I mean, you take it pretty seriously. I think, you know, to touch on something that's fucking horrendous, but current, you know, look at what's going, what happened in Maine. Yeah. I mean, and there, and it's such a nuanced conversation because people, oh man, it, it actually breaks my heart how one issue they want to be about it. Mm-hmm. And, and, you know, there's the weapon aspect and people immediately dive into that. And then you hear the guy was committed and let go because he was having voices about, you know, I need to shoot a place up. And then you hear that his girlfriend, uh, what I read in the news, <clears throat> and, you know, maybe this will be found to be different or untrue, but this is what I just recently read in the news is that he had just gone through a breakup and there's a chance that he selected the two locations that he went to because she used to frequent those. My personal opinion on guns, I have them with me all the time, just fucking gun in my fanny pack on the table. They function, they malfunction, or they rust. If they are, And if you put it on a table here, it would do nothing until the end of time because it can't do anything by itself. It's mm-hmm. the intent of the person who has it in their hand that can either do amazing protective things with it or horrendous evil things with it. And so that drives me to, well, what would make the difference between person doing that? Mental health... I don't think if like if we had to grade, I don't like to say globally because I don't travel that much internationally. But if I had to grade the U.S. on a scale of one to ten for mental health, one being you might need to go into a rubber room, and ten is you're living in a you know it rains fucking gumdrops on you, you know, and it's rainbows everywhere. Free. Man, I was gonna say I'd, I'd be stretched to say five, but people are in it. Yeah. And I think social media has – it's not the cause of it, but I think it's ca- – ca- there's a correlation. Look at COVID. COVID. Skyrocketing problems. The number that. of suicides that went through – well, and this was the isolation. But, but you're yeah. isolated but kind of not because, oh, let me get my anxiety rectangle out and I can connect with the world. Yeah. I experienced this <clears> – <throat> let me be clear. Mm-hmm. I'm really lucky I didn't have social media when I was growing up <laughs> because I don't think I would have used it well. Mm-hmm. Looking back at my younger self, I – was capable of and often made horrible choices with what I said and did. And I am so incredibly grateful that I didn't have that device. Mm -hmm. And I, with all three of my kids, they have been on both sides where they have said and done some shit that was inappropriate. And then my daughter has been on the receiving end of some stuff where you can't escape it because people you don't even know. That scares me so much with my own kids. People you don't even know all over the fucking world who maybe maybe they're towards the one scale of Mm -hmm. mental health are just bombarded barding people with things that you would never say face to face. And if you don't control that device, that thing will control you. Yeah. And at a young age where all of their friends are on it, um, you know, there was a short period of time where my daughter just seemed exhausted and she spends more uh, time living with her mom than she does spending time with me. So I'm not trying to paint this picture that I'm always with her and I want to be honest about where I am in my life. But come to find out you know the when the alert is on it goes off at two o'clock in the morning they hear it they react and maybe they go back to sleep but it's this disrupted sleep you're not actually Mm -hmm. resting and you can't even disconnect so that i mean again i don't think that's the cause of mental health i think it's corollary the fact that we have access to information that we never would like if an earthquake hits and kills five thousand people in pakistan you know about it in 30 seconds whereas when we were growing up it would have been maybe a week if i even knew about it No, i was just talking to somebody about that recently they they were, I think it was somebody in my family, and they were saying, we're living almost along the lines of we're living in the worst time. And I'm like, no, that's- Statistically, that's, it's actually the I, safest time ever to be a human being. That's what I was telling her. I go, just because you're hearing every single bad thing in real time, there's been a hundred times worse things happening yeah. all throughout history leading up to this. 
So you can't sit there and just think, oh, because we just heard about the Gaza, that that's the worst thing that's ever happened. Yeah. Way worse has happened. We're just watching it now unfold. Way worse real. is happening. Yeah. I mean, so yeah, the mental health aspect, it is a, it's a tough one. And I just, I just try to be honest with my own experiences with it. I have a hard time with the amount of people that have the problems that get medication thrown at it. Cause I don't well, know why it's button. not discussed. Like, what was that guy on the main guy? Was he sober with those thoughts or did he have issues and he was on a battery of I, that's a medication? Good, that's a good question. I actually hadn't thought about that. And I'm assuming, uh, sounds like he suck started his pistol, which is a, a far, uh, better death than I would have wished upon him. Yeah. I, I have creative streaks at time. You mean the potato peeler? <laughs> I can I can do better. The potato peeler is like that's again, just your your knee jerk. That's yeah. my opener. If you give me enough time, and if they would ever consult with me to, like, I'll just take forty eight hours with this guy yeah. in a room with no cameras, and at the end, the end state will be achieved. But don't judge my methods. <laughs> I'm I'd be curious. I want to know if he was on stuff because most I do people too. that do that are on stuff. So I guess he was hearing voices. Yeah. Which, so, and do again, you go from normal to do it hearing that or do you have problems and you get on stuff and then hear voices? Because I feel like most of the time you hear about that after somebody's on medication. So let's preface what we're reading here. And it's it's a, the individual's name. It's a, a brief description of him. I think we can all agree at this point from what we've seen over a variety of issues is that the first things that are reported immediately are often not the most accurate. So I take all of this with a grain. Yeah. And I think... It'll be a while. I'm sure they will do a toxicology report, but I think it'll be a while before a lot of the information actually comes out. Yeah. Unfortunately, the vast majority of people will have forgotten about this before that information comes out, which sucks. Well, yeah, because it happens so much. Well, not even that it happens so much. There's going to be something else that nukes your phone and you're going to be hearing about that and then you're going to be hearing about something else and then mm-hmm. you're going to be hearing about something else it's it, again i think it goes back to the question i have is that are human beings even designed to deal with this level of information that we now have access to I, i've told people my family a lot i would say like o2 with the spiral I, ipod oh yeah when i had 2000 songs in my pocket did you pay let's for call them? it did you pay for them i don't know <laughs> LimeWire existed. <laughs> you don't even know about illegal music downloading, do you? Uh, I mean, yeah, I don't need to use Dude, it. I wrote a 10-page paper in high school <laughs> why downloading music from LimeWire should be legal. Because I'm not stealing it. Somebody gave it to me, and I'm just pulling it off the internet. <laughs> Fucking Michael. You didn't even live through the, the dark ages of the internet when we were building it brick by brick. No, yeah, <laughs> by that, I mean Al Gore, <laughs> single-handedly. Dial up internet, just stealing songs off. <laughs> Dude, downloading music that you... It's not like today where there's Spotify or Pandora or even an iTunes subscription. You can put... I, I don't know how any of that shit works, yeah. other than I've heard that the artists just keep getting yeah. paid less and less. <laughs> there were entire... Just look up... What was it? It was uh, Metallica and who was that fucking... Uh, the Napster guy. Yes. <laughs> and I, God, I what get... was his name? He's in the Facebook movie. Uh, Justin Timberlake played him in the Facebook movie. Uh, Sean. Sean. Yeah, Sean something. Yeah. But yeah, man, it like changed and broke the music industry, Michael. Metallica versus Napster. Oh yeah, yep. it was huge. Sean. Sean. Yeah. Parker. Yep. Yep. Yeah. God, that was a useless piece of fucking information. <laughs> I just pulled out of my head. <laughs> There you go. There's your reading for tonight, Michael. Yeah. Learn okay. about the internet before you were probably even born. <laughs> um, 2000? No, I was born. How old what you? year were you born? 99. Yeah, so you were shitting in a diaper, not involved <laughs> like we were in the trench warfare not of digital even, online like, music download. Was, to be clear, I was in fourth grade in 1999. <laughs> yeah, to be clear, I never downloaded any of that music either. I'm just trying to get Michael shit. <laughs> okay, what are we talking I'll about? I'll read up on it. You should. Um, I picked oh, up the, the book 1984, by the way. Oh, did you? Yeah, I did. You're gonna start oh, that's a good it? episode. Yeah. I'm going to have to pick that up, yeah, too. Uh, it's, yeah. it's a really good that, book. I can't, 1940? Is that when you said it was? 1984. Uh, ni- oh, 1984. And there was another book there that somebody had recommended. No, when he wrote it. Anim- oh, yeah. It was in- Ni- he wrote it in the 1940s. Uh, Brave yeah. New World. Great book. Also. Animal House, I think it was. That Animal I House, yeah. Yes. Or uh, Animal Farm, I think. 
<laughs> there was also, an Orwell section. Also I, by Orwell. I grabbed a couple. Yeah. Signed a few Jack Carr books, <laughs> and then went on my way down to the perfect Missoula Barnes and Noble. Enjoy, yes, <laughs> yeah. But uh, medication, yeah. I don't know how much of an effect psych meds are having on people because I know that when my wife went through stuff, and she she already told me we can touch on this a little bit. So postpartum, I mean, you're pretty average case of a bad postpartum depression after a birth. I don't know if you have any experience with that, but that shit's real. Yes, and. It bums me out that some women probably don't have husbands that know what that could be like. Um, thank God I had some experience so I could recognize it. And she was brave enough to actually admit stuff and get help. And within six months, she was good. Yeah. I mean, we literally, but it took. Did she use the medications as a bridge? Yeah. So the kicker with the medication thing, though, and why I even believe more about this, too, is so she went and got help. She got on some medication not working probably making it worse but recognize that quickly too so then by the luck of god we found a hormone specialist in our area um shout out uh judith crabtree if i ever see that lady i'm gonna give her a big old hug so she went to this hormone specialist this lady did like 23 and me blood mm-hmm. tests i mean a battery of things determined what she was off on gave her a bunch of um, just natural supplements to like counterbalance whatever hormones were off. Yeah. And then found out because of her blood type that a specific um, medication would be the one to take. Got her on the right stuff for her body, like real like depression medication for her body. And within three, four months she was done and then weaned her off and she's been good. How many appointments did she have with the person before they prescribed antidepressants? Well, it was kind of like we have to do something now. So it was it was day one, but but, that, but, but I don't but, think that's atypical. That's the experience I've had with quite a few friends who will go in and have one, maybe two conversations, mm-hmm. and they leave with a script for an SSRI, super powerful. Whereas what you're talking about, this woman who took the time, all mm-hmm. of these other tests, that's not something that you're going to do in an hour or a day. So the one who prescribed that day one. <clears throat> It was kind of like an all hands on deck. Yeah. We have to do something now, and then and it, I don't then it was that like person then it was like, then it, yeah. And she was fantastic. And yeah. I mean, I was sitting in on the thing. Like she, it wasn't like a oh just do this. It was like a we're gonna make a first step. Um, then I'm gonna get you in touch with this person. And so she was the one that put us in touch with that person. So I have nothing but respect for that. My yeah. issue comes with, and I have plenty of experience, not directly, but with people that I know in my social circle who it wasn't an all hands deck like mm-hmm. the smoke was not pouring out of the windows oh man and within maybe a few hours of spending time with somebody it's here's your prescription instead of t- i mean it, so if you come in on your first step i mean i looking back in 07 when that happened to me the smartest thing i could have ever done was have the courage to be able to admit to my parents that something was wrong cuz i should have got help i mean for sure um I don't know what it is. If you go in on your first thing, I guess it depends on what were you going there for? Is it like yeah. a, I mean, it depends, I guess, where you're at. I mean, can they give you a tool to immediately start making change on your first trip? You know what I mean? Like if you show up and you're having problems and I go, hey, I'm feeling this way and I'm talking to the therapist. Are they able in one, a one first hour session to give you tools that you're going to leave there feeling better? I think that they can. Le- I think they could probably prescribe tools. Whether or not it yeah. makes you feel better or it yeah. compounds the issue, I think is the yeah. greater question. Okay. And I and I don't know the prescription guidelines. Anybody who listens to this podcast will know I'm not a psychiatrist or psychologist. <laughs> <clears throat> but I I'm again just from people that I know in my own personal life, the rapidity that they can get prescribed something, and I have watched it. I. And I'll be very transparent. I have watched it have incredible impact in some people's lives. And I have watched it absolutely completely flatline people's personalities and drive them to a place where I wasn't necessarily worried before and got exceptionally worried just by the drastic change in who they became. And that almost feels like it's the norm. Not kind of. The, not the norm, but it seems like that happens more than you get fixed and you feel great and then you get off of it. And some people think... Well, I mean, maybe it's true. I'm not like, like you said, I'm not 
a psychiatrist, but some people, shouldn't you be on it and you get better and then be able to get off it? Because some people just take it forever, which I don't, I don't have any experience in the, on the topic, but shouldn't the goal be to get off of it and find tools to be able to be better without medication? I think if your body is capable of doing so, if you're fixing or – again, that's why I asked if it was the bridge. Mm-hmm. God, I'm not. Michael, can you look up if SSRIs are supposed to be taken forever or if they're – and the problem with this is if you go on the internet looking for something, you're going to find exactly what you're looking for. I yeah. wish <clears throat> maybe for a, a educated professional listening to this episode or watching, put it in the comments because I'd be, I'd be curious what they're designed for. Were you aware that you could take a blood test and get something specific to your, absolutely not. I was not aware of that. I was neither until this happened. And I'm like, that's another thing where I was like, I had to at least touch on that here. Yeah. Cause if you're taking a medication, you start feeling worse the medication can literally not be compatible with your blood type like anything else you take as far as I can understand to the point where there's literally probably a medication that works better for your blood type. That, yeah. Like explore those options. Go find some kind of hormone specialist that knows something about that field can give you all the tests necessary and actually prescribe something for you, not just a blanket depression medication. So for people with chronic or severe depression, medication may be needed on a long-term basis. In these cases, antidepressants are often taken indefinitely. Okay, so that's for people with chronic or severe depression. I will, I mean, I'll fill in the negative space here a little bit. It seems like then if you don't have chronic or severe depression, then perhaps it wouldn't be taken indefinitely. It would be used to bridge the gap to Mm -hmm. wherever you may land up. Yeah, it's scary stuff, man. It is very scary stuff. It's, to me, the most... It's like the worst aspect of humanity. Do you think people have the perception that life is about being happy? Yeah. Because I don't personally think that's what it's about. I don't think that's what it's about. I don't think it's about that at all. There are moments in my life where I've been exceptionally happy. I think, I don't even necessarily know how to describe it, but I have no expectation that every day I'm going to wake up with a huge smile on my face. Yeah. I think that's for me what makes life more interesting. Not that I'm like hoping to wake up, ah, oh, go to bed. I'm like, I really wish that I have a shit day tomorrow. Like that's not what I'm aiming for, but it can't all be just peaks. My whole goal and how I feel most of the time is you should just be comfortable. Like it is what it is. We're all here. Bad stuff happens. Good stuff happens. Like once you can get comfortable that you really don't have that much control, you feel way better. I mean, I was talking to some buddies recently and we were having some drinks around the table and they said something about, I forget exactly what they said, but they said something along the lines of they, I envy you kind of. And where I was like, what do you mean? Like, well, you just seem like you kind of have it figured out. I mean, I got the house, the kids and I'm like, yeah, I guess people could think that because that's, I, I f- that's what they see though. Yeah. Cause I faked that for four years and I went through something that gave me a different perspective than most people have. I mean, I can look back and go, I got through that. I'm here. I literally feel like I'm here, man. I, I made it. I am a happy person. Like I do wake up every day and I'm like, this is fucking rad. Like I have a ton of interests. I get pretty animated with how much I love the stuff I love. I mean, I can talk about movies forever, music forever, golf. I've got a lot of hobbies and I'm just, I just have a different perspective. You know, golf's not a hobby, right? Is it a lifestyle? No. <laughs> it's not. Would you consider golf to be a sport? Yeah. How about ping pong? Um, If ping pong could win a green jacket and bring in millions to- and millions of dollars, I, I would call it that. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if you've seen the documentary Forrest Gump, but it led to a sponsorship and he went and beat everybody in China. Yeah, you're right. Wasn't he dual wielding the ping pong paddles? No, I think he had two balls. <laughs> it's a lot like Michael in that respect. He can handle both at the same. So not a golf fan. <laughs> Golf's okay. It's one of the most frustrating activities. I'm not oh. going to call it a sport because it's yeah. not. 100%. Yeah. You want to talk about something you're never going to master? Golf. Yeah, or jujitsu. I'd rather go with the jujitsu yeah. path. <laughs> yeah. If I, if, there are, if, there, if I have to participate in an activity that I can't master, whacking that white ball versus attempting to choke somebody until they're unconscious, I'm going with the latter. Dude, I just played... <clears throat> until you get elbowed in the eye. I just played and I shot like a 105, and I was like, I'm not going to play for the foreseeable future. Would you uh, shoot on the back nine? 
103. <laughs> the number of times I've quit after nine holes, like, fuck this. I'm never playing this. See, I've never been like that. Like, when I picked up golf, it was on the back end. Or actually, when I picked up golf, it was during the time I'm talking about. Really? So it was another tool that I think, like, looking back, you guys talk about all this shit that gets you through stuff. And I'm like, the whole time I'm going, yeah, I did that on accident. Yeah. When I was going through stuff. Oh, did that on accident. For me, golf was another activity that was like, if you're standing over that ball, trying to make sure you make contact and make it to the green, a little hard to be worrying about other stuff. And that's just another activity to keep your brain occupied. Like true. It, it keeps your focus on something productive. Instead of sitting there pissed off how you feel and being uncomfortable with life, go force yourself to do something that's going to take your mind off of it. And if you can focus, I mean, at golf, that's when I really got into playing guitar. Total distraction. I mean, yeah. you're sitting there sucking out playing guitar, focusing on teaching yourself how to read tabs and play it to a song. Really hard to start woe is me it and thinking how shitty life is when you're just locked into something. And I was doing that stuff without knowing that it was helping. I just, it was just an escape at the time. Yeah. But that's kind of what golf started out for me. Now it's just a frustrating activity that I still like to do. <laughs> Just remember, it's voluntary. Yeah. You can end this journey at any I like time. Suffering. <laughs> Jiu Jitsu will provide plenty of that for you. I saw you in class yesterday. You were out there getting after Dude, it. Dude, I had Leo all the was like, moisture hey, maybe. sucked out of my mouth and my head, I think, by the end of that thing. <laughs> You'll love this, Dude, Michael. My tongue after... was stuck to the roof of my mouth. I was like, Fuck, Andy's here. <laughs> so I, I showed up just for the eight o'clock open mat. Yeah. And uh, Tyler and I got there a little bit early. Damn. No, Tyler and I. Oh, my oh, son. Oh, I know your name's Taylor. <laughs> like, what the fuck are you talking about? I know you. A... <laughs> no, Tyler, my son. He showed up. With okay, me. yeah, yeah. Close, but not. Oh, the I didn't same. even know that your, your son was there. Okay. Yeah, Tyler. Okay. He was the white belt going absolutely crazy, trying shit that he saw mm, on YouTube, gotcha. uh, prepping for a competition, <laughs> trying to just really. Oh, with Leah at the end there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, his main nemesis, the Dagestani Hammer, is in his uh, <laughs> weight division. So Dagestani they... Wolf. Dagestani Hammer is what I call him. Um, this kid's like seventeen. I don't know him from Adam. I'm not even sure he's from Dagestan, but. Whatever. Um, and at the end of class, Leah goes up to Taylor and goes, you should probably be done. <laughs> yeah, I'm sitting there drinking water. I was sitting there drinking water, trying to, trying to gain my composure. To go back out there for the hour. And I'm watching. Uh -huh. I'm deep breathing and just drinking water like I can do it. And then she goes, hey, Taylor. I was like, what's up? She's like, how you feeling? I was like, I'm pretty tired. She was like, yeah, you should probably call it. <laughs> I was like, okay. I guess they did awesome. a bunch of comp team uh, practice rounds. Oh, that's right. Positional I forgot stuff, it was. Yeah. yeah. I yeah. showed up and I go, yeah, I'm just going to take it easy and haven't been doing it. And she's like, well, we're all training for a tournament. So we're going to be going. It's an in-house tournament. It's not that hard. <laughs> I really like that positional stuff, though, mm -hmm. where you highlight, hey, you're going to start in back control and you don't have to worry about the fight that or a mistake you may have made to get there. Yeah. You just have to worry about that aspect of it. I enjoy it. I do not know why I have two stripes in my white belt because I cannot figure out how to do the most basic shit still like that's like, what two stripes on your white belt means dude when i'm like in when somebody's got closed guard yep do not know how to pass it no clue isn't that day one shit i should probably know that by now that is not day one shit oh that's not day one shit okay. no okay no michael what do you think how long have you been doing jujitsu now four years four years purple belt i would say closed guard Closest to gay porn that yeah. there is, which I, for like two dudes. I hate it. I hate close I guard. send my wife a video because Leah posted a video of us doing it. I send my wife the video that she took because I'm the first person in the clip. Yeah. And I'm on bottom. Yeah. I go, hey, that's me in the white and bottom missionary. <laughs> she was, yeah. She was I like, mean, power bottom like, actual over here. <laughs> what are you doing? He, he, I know all about he that. He really tries to dominate the bottom. No. <laughs> so for close guard, who people who are already like, what in the actual fuck are you guys talking about? <laughs> Is somebody laying on their back and you wrap your legs around and lock your ankles around another dude and you just pull them hard towards you. You have to be pretty comfortable with your sexuality. <laughs> you do well, and at that point, you're just like this. It, uh, this sucks. I want to get out. So you're the, actually the least thing, the last thing in your mind that you're thinking about is anything related to that. No. But if you were to just show a picture of that to a random sampling of people with the question "gay or not," man, it's going to be tough to get some not gay or answers. Got, or when you got a back position and Leah's like talking to you, and you're just all holding it. You're all just sitting around holding I feel it, like that, and we're yeah. all just kind of looking like. <laughs> yeah, I feel like the back control is less gay than having a dude in your clothes guard, and I don't. I have no data to support any of this. 
But it was hilarious. Yeah. 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 You should probably be done. No, she called it, and I was like, <laughs> by all means. <laughs> the open mat is my favorite part. You just gotta yeah. stay out there and just fight people for an hour. Oh yeah, yeah. So. See, I'm still working on regulating everything to be able to do it for the whole time. I mean, I'll have like bursts of trying to use strength and you just get gassed. I just still don't know how to regulate. I mean, time on the mat, man. Yeah. I am not a jujitsu jujitsu knowledgeable person or Rolodex or anybody that somebody should listen to, but I have heard it said time and time again, Yeah, just time on the mats. Mm-hmm. So yeah. Yeah. I'm glad you got to come to class. Yeah. Um, so I, so you haven't done any psychedelics. Zero. Do you have any mild desire from the people who have had good experiences? Yes, I have okay. what I would describe as a curiosity. I was just having, uh, I'll leave his name out of it, but I was just having a conversation with a friend of mine who said about once every three months, he'll take the day off work, both he and his wife will. And I don't know what dosage they'll take of mushrooms, mm-hmm. but they just spend the day together. And he described it as 20 years of marriage counseling in a day. Wow. Now, I have no f- context for mm-hmm. what he's saying. Uh, and I have a bunch of friends who have just described um, mushrooms and again, I don't know the dosages that they're taking. So I, I have no mm-hmm. ability to say or describe the journey that they went on, but it's either mood stabilizing or something that they'll do once or twice a year to reground themselves, recenter themselves, whatever it is. But to me, having no experience with that, it's hard to wrap my brain around how that's kind of possible. Yeah. <clears throat> so how I understand it, and I, by no means an expert. Like I said, it's been 16 years since I did it. I had a handful of experiences. Um, it, it has the like potential to do all the stuff they're saying. Like I can see how if you already have a bunch of issues, it can solve it. But on the same token, if you don't and you do it wrong, it could cause all the same issues that other people are trying to fix. Does it actually solve the issues or does it provide for you insight as a person that you can take action on those issues? Exactly that. Yep. Because that's also another mistake and something that I'm concerned about with the absolute explosion and interest of veterans seeking psychedelic therapy. Mm -hmm. Again, I'll leave the names out of it. I know some people who now it's all about how often can they go down and, and, you know, I don't know these people well, but uh, I don't think you're supposed to do ayahuasca 20 plus times. In the course of two years. That's wild. But it becomes about, you know, they, and perhaps, and I, of course, making wild assumptions, but perhaps for that person that goes down and it opens that door and they see something that they need to work on. I know people that I used to work with who would probably arrive at the headspace if one is good, 500 is better. Yeah. So it just becomes layer on top of layer on top of layer on top of layer. And then honestly, you see that person starting to disappear, which yeah. is a, it's a, that's not a very precise way to describe it, but that the it becomes almost about now their journey that's through their that. identity now. Yes, I'm the mushroom guy, or I'm this ayahuasca guy. It hasn't been the the guys that I have seen that have kind of lost themselves in it. It wasn't mushrooms. It was mm. the more powerful shit that seems like is a shotgun blast to your face mm. that most people would want to avoid. But they'll go you down. Take enough mushrooms. <laughs> it's a well, shotgun. Blast. Well, I could, yeah. Like yeah, I said, yeah. I have no context. Yeah. But I'm talking, you know, from what I've heard people describe about mushrooms, or in comparison to uh, ibogaine, where you're throwing up for 24 hours. Yeah. You know, like it seems like it's a very different ride, mm-hmm. if you will. Yeah, I mean, it sounds like it's the most powerful psychedelic that there is. Um, so why would you want to do it 24 times in like two well, it's years? Clearly not for you. If you need to be doing it that much, or you've lost yourself in the journey. Yeah. And instead of doing the pre-work and addressing the things that it potentially revealed to you, it becomes about the medicine mm-hmm. in and of itself. I'm also not so – I'm not for or against this, but I wonder whether or not calling it medicine is actually a good idea. Maybe there's a word in between drug and medicine that we could use to Tool. describe. Tool, perhaps? I don't think – yeah, I don't think medicine. I think it could be used as a very beneficial tool. I know why <clears> – <throat> I understand why people use the term medicine because it rounds the edge on what people think of a drug. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I think that could be considered a slippery slope, just my personal opinion. So what I think it has the potential to do is just remove you from yourself for a little bit. And like Rogan has talked about with like the dissolving of the ego, I think it's, it makes you not think about stuff as seriously, at least the stuff you shouldn't be as much as you 
need to be. Um, for me, like I was 17, so I, yeah, knew, t- I didn't know anything. Walk me into how you first got exposed yeah. to him and just t- take me through your journey. Yeah, so 17, um, dabbling in weed, um, wanted to do mushrooms. What was your, where did the interest in mushrooms come from? Like I said, probably like an Apatow movie. I think I probably saw um, Seth Rogen doing mushrooms and Knocked Up or some other movie and went, that looks funny. That's probably a cool experience. Just super naive about what it could mean to do that. Um, If in one of those movies, the scene had been not somebody doing mushrooms, but they were maybe on the working or operating side of a glory hole, (laughs) would you have considered that as well too? Am I on the giving or the... You're on the operating side. <laughs> you're you're making the equipment work, if you know what I mean. <laughs> no, so, I mean, I was just... Just checking how influenced you are by modern culture. No, so, <laughs> it just was very appealing to me. I think at the time, I just wanted some experience. I mean, I came from a family, and let me be really clear. I came from a really good family. Like, as far as I knew, nobody in my family has ever done anything like this. I felt like a black sheep when I was in high school. Didn't really tell them anything. Kind of thought... Nobody in my family have ever even had desires to do that kind of stuff. So I was just kind of naive trying to experience stuff that I probably had no business trying to experience at such a young age. And now looking back, you hear people talk about 17 to 23 is the biggest time for a person to have mental health problems, especially in men. Yeah. And I was fucking around with psychedelics in the hot zone. Trying to understand reality while on something that modifies Not even trying reality. to understand reality. Thinking I had it figured out because I'm 17 and I literally had never looked at myself from the view of somebody else in my life. So we go to do mushrooms and I knew somebody who knew somebody. We got some. Um, got enough for three of us to do it. Uh, three good doses, I think, so we can all have a pretty good trip. And so the goal was, hey, we're going to get together. We're going to do these. I was the one that had them. Um, we got to a party or I got to a party, multiple people there were drinking, not knowing you should not drink if you're going to do mushrooms. So I had some drinks and then those guys don't show up. And I'm like, well, we were supposed to do this tonight. How come? Like, what the hell? And I was like, I guess I can wait. Well, after a couple of drinks, I go, I'll just do my dose tonight. I really want to do them. I'll just do them. So multiple people leave. There's probably four or five people left and I go do my dose. So I eat it. You just eat the mushroom straight? No, I I think I paired it with like tri-tip because they say to eat it with food. And I mean, a, that's pretty and good. I, and I'm a dumbass. And that's, I thought you were going to say pizza or and something. And that's what I put it with. I'm pretty, sure I grab, I'm pretty sure I grabbed cold <laughs> tri-tip out of the fridge, put them on it, and ate piece by piece. That's pretty awesome. <laughs> At 17, I probably would have gone with like a Dorito. but Yeah, so I take that and we go back. And at this point, the guys not doing it are like, is it kicked in yet? I mean, so now we're talking about set and setting. I mean, you hear people talk about all the time. If you're going to do this stuff, don't drink, do it in a good environment, do it with good people and be aware what can happen and go with it. So one dose in, they're like, you feel anything? I'm like, "Mm, not really. How much time it expired? I would say (gasps) probably 15 to 30 minutes. Okay. But zero research. I mean, I had no clue. I didn't know anything about it. So 15, 30 minutes, I go, are they duds? So I go back out to my car and I eat more. So now we're probably two. No tri-tip at this time? I I can't remember. I mean, maybe I paired it with stuff every time. But so then I go back to the car, eat some more, um, come back in. And now it's like, sure, the classic, oh, you're seeing, not seeing and hallucinating things, but colors are vivid, different like kind of warm, vibrant. And now my buddies are kind of like, what do you see? Like, I mean, not conducive to somebody doing mushrooms for the first time. Almost like they're 17. Almost like we're all 17 being idiots. And at that point, I'm like, I really thought this was going to be cooler. This isn't what I thought. So I went and polished the bag off. And so now I've got three doses, which I'm sure somebody listening can probably tell me what that is. But if three people wanted to have good trips... I ate that much. I have no idea in grams how much that could be. So then I come back in and we're all hanging out and now it's getting a little more wild, um, in terms of like stuff you're seeing and, and I don't know what it was, but at some point they all go to bed. I'm still up and now I'm in the throes of a gnarly trip and I'm just in 
it started by just like thinking like this is wild like i didn't know you could be thinking this kind of stuff and just about life and i ended up being like this is too much to handle i'm gonna sleep on this couch since everybody else is in bed and so i got on that couch with my mind still racing and do you have any control over your mind at that point or it just goes where it wants zero i mean it just it's like when you lay in bed and you just have scattered thoughts but they're wild um so I'm laying on the couch and I end up feeling like paralyzed. I mean, not feeling paralyzed, like I'm paralyzed. I'm laying on my side. All I can move are my eyes. And I'm like, huh, that's odd. They had horses on the property. Eventually I heard like stuff in my, like I thought a horse was in my ear, but then you can't look like, I can't look to be like that fucker get in the house. Like that's like how it was. So I'm paralyzed. How would the horse have gotten in the house? Well, I thought it was like, is there an open window next to my head? And that fucker stuck its head through the window and is literally just going in my ear. I was going to say, I'm thinking the doorknob. Like, did they bite it and rotate? Like, how did the horse get in the house? I literally was like, did he leave a window open? That horse's face is right next to my ear. I swear to God, dude, it's in my ear. And I'm going, I'm literally trying to look and I can't move my head. So everything you've described so far is why I'm deathly afraid. I know. I told you. I I told you. Dude, I told you. Yeah. So... So I'm laying there. That's happening. I eventually was like, so paralyzed. That's happening. Now I got to piss harder than I've ever had to piss in my entire life. But I can't get up to go pee. I also don't have function of my bladder, so I can't pee. So I just have to pee really bad and I can't do anything about it. And it gets worse and worse. If I had to guess, I'm on this couch for three hours. Eventually, with your mind racing, I started thinking... Oh shit, did I die? (laughs) Dude, I'm not kidding. So my thought literally is like, did I die? And I'm like, well, I don't know, because I'm still thinking. And then I went, oh, not only did I, maybe did I die? Maybe this is hell. Maybe I died and went to hell. Then I'm thinking, maybe I died and went to hell. And for some reason, I was worse than I thought I was. I don't know what I deserve to be in this position, because I thought I was a pretty decent dude. But now I'm dead and in hell, what got me here? And then it was thinking about that for a couple hours. And to the point where, and this is, dude, imagine a month ago, I had to unpack all this for my mom when I told her I was coming on here. And she had no idea. Nobody in my family to this day, I got buddies right now that have no idea what I'm talking about. How did she receive that message? Dude, I told her, hey, mom, Andy just said, come do cleared hot. It's hilarious that your mother listens, by the way. Dude, she goes. I apologize for most of the things Michael and I say to each other. They're not appropriate. I'm almost positive she started unfollowing (laughs) you on Instagram when she started seeing people wreck on bikes. I don't blame her. I think I've posted some people dying. I'm not sure. Dude, you have single-handedly ruined my Instagram algorithm. (laughs) I think you mean fixed it. People ask me how I find that stuff, and the true answer is it finds me. The, I don't look for it. It looks for me. The gnarliest one you did was the dude sitting at a podium and the screens coming down and literally according to him. And I'm yeah. like, that's an upgrade from the bikes. <laughs> and then I rewinded it about five times to figure out, is he really just going just? Yeah. Yes, and he, he is. is. He yeah. was. He's now shorter. <laughs> if he's not underground. He's 100% dead. <sighs> Man. Some of the, let me just tell you, <clears throat> I'm a fan of that stuff. And there are quite a few that I see where I want to post, but I don't want to do that to people. So you're not posting the stuff that you don't want to. Bro, I don't, I assume that Instagram can't keep up with the volume of videos because there are straight up people dying. Well, that's a whole nother issue. How, how is that on Instagram? But if Mike Glover says you should be able to start a fire, gets blocked. Well, he's a domestic terrorist. That's right. I forgot. Yeah, that's the main reason yeah, why. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. And I don't, what I don't think is that there is a human being making that decision. I think there's some really complicated math that I yeah. don't understand for all of those systems to function. And for whatever reason, it's probably not that post would yeah. be my guess. It's a combination of things that hit whatever net that exists and it's, yeah. it triggers it. Well, God forbid my son at 10 is going to have an Instagram watching people die daily and be 
have like him not completely f- desensitized to. You should block me from his account <laughs> because I'm I'm not going to stop posting those. Oh stories. no, no, I'm not asking you to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, but every yeah. once in a while I'll, I'll take a little break and then I'll throw a banger on there, and people are like, "God damn it!" <laughs> well, dude, there was another one. It was the the thing over the singer's head. Oh, uh, dead. It was basically the exact same thing as the accordion guy, and I'm like, I believe that was a Korean yeah. pop star. Yeah, it was a group of five. Now perhaps it's a group of four. <laughs> Four and a half. I'm not so sure that guy survived. So imagine dropping this story I'm telling you about to my mom. I, I had to tell, I had to go through because I didn't want any of my family to hear this after the fact and be like, "What?" Yeah. So I had to go make my rounds. I mean, I literally told my mom. How'd you take it? Very upset. Upset about what had happened, or upset that you didn't tell her? Like, very, very sad. I had to go through that. I mean, crying like it was it was a very shocking thing to tell her. Does she wish that you would have told her at the time? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. But I told her, I'm like, remember what it was like back then. Well, that, and that's another thing I did keep telling her this is 16 years ago. Yeah. I'm like, I have been good for over a decade. So I'm like, I, like you talk about looking at yourself as almost a different human being. Oh, for sure. That's how I look at this whole time frame. It just happened to be horrific. Um and yeah, she didn't take it good. And so we had the whole conversation, like she felt like a failure as a parent. And I'm like, it had no bearing on you. Then so when we got into a discussion about having kids, them being different out of the box. I mean, you can only do so much. Yeah. There's nature and there's nurture. I don't think it's one or the other. She could have done everything in her power. I don't think there was anything that would have kept me from wanting to experience stuff. I mean, it's fair. Real, I really don't. It's accurate too. I, I was, I think out of the gate, I've always been like an artistic, curious person. And that was just a path. I was just curious about stuff and wanted to, to try that. So I think it's actually an important thing for parents to think about. I'm a uh, Mm -hmm. father to two boys and a girl. Couldn't be different. All three of them. Um, They have their individual strengths. They have their individual weaknesses. And I don't care if you are nature or nurture, Mm -hmm. your kids are going to make all of the choices that you would never want them to make, regardless of which path you go down. Yeah. And, uh, it, that's a tough cookie to chew up and swallow as a parent, because your number one fear is I want to, you know, I want to protect my kids. I don't want anything to happen, Yeah. but you could actually ruin them for their long-term future. If you stuff them into a box in the corner and wrap it in bubble wrap, Yeah. that's not going to work either. No. It's tough realizing how little impact and control you actually have over their decisions. Well, I have a, I have a four-year-old and a one-and-a-half-year-old daughter. Four-year-old son, one-and-a-half-year-old daughter. I can't think of anything more I want than to have an open dialogue about what can happen yep. with mental health. Um, I'm not shy about what I've experienced. Like, I want them to know, hey, dad made some stupid decisions, so you should probably know about them. That way you're not out there taking three doses of mushrooms. Um, so I, that's how I'm going to raise them. I mean, I'm going to be strict and I don't want them to do it. I want to warn them about what can happen. But for me, it's an open and honest dialogue around it. I think that's the best approach. The last thing I would want is my son to be having (coughs) any kind of wild thought and be afraid to tell me. And I'm not saying that as blaming my parents for not making that something that could happen. Generations are different. I mean, I had to tell my grandparents this too. How'd they take it? My grandma immediately started crying <laughs> and I didn't, I went very broad. Like I'm telling them not to listen to this cause they're not going to, they so don't they're, need, they they're don't need 100% hear. going to, <laughs> no, they won't. They can't find this podcast. <laughs> That's what the younger people are for. This you should, I swear to God. So my dad now lives up here yeah. for a week. Oh, he just moved it. Yeah. Nice. He lives here for a fucking week. He had an Apple TV remote in his front breast pocket because he couldn't figure out how to charge it. So he would come into the coffee. Michael's dude, dying dude. We're in the coffee shop one day. I'm like, Dad, what is that? The Apple TV? He had his readers. Yeah. And I just see the top of it a, a gray Apple TV remote. I'm like, why? He's like, oh yeah, I can't. I can't figure out how to fucking charge this thing. I've been asking people. He's going over to people having coffee. Hey, do you know how to charge this? And they're like, get out of here, you creepy old man. Dude, I was my grandparents' like tech support for like a four-year period until yeah. I tapped out and I gave it to my mom. And my mom is now 100% their tech support. But your grandparents will find somebody who will be able to show them what that button means. So my, I'm like, Dad. They don't want to hear this stuff, though. 
But I'm like, hey, Dad, it, you charge it with the same cable that you you have a charger remote. You have an iPhone. Yeah, it's it's the same. It's uh, what is the lightning cable? Okay, for the old ones. I'm like, it's the same cable. And he goes, well, I don't have one of those. I'm like, what's your what's your battery at at your phone? Oh, it's full. How come? Oh, well, I charge it when I sleep. I'm like, I I can't work with this. <laughs> Unplug your phone and plug in yeah. the Apple TV remote. A fucking week left breast pocket. <laughs> That's my dad, in a nutshell. In the coffee shop, drinking hot chocolate, giving people advice on coffee. Oh, my God. Never had a cup of coffee in his life. Wow. You want to hear the, the best part? So he's uh, – <clears throat> his beard is glorious. He got kicked out of uh, – I've seen it. Yeah. He got kicked out of I think it was fourth or fifth grade because he had to go home and shave. Mm -hmm. He and – <laughs> yeah. Oh, dude. So th the jeans passed me over and hit my sister square in the back, if you know what I mean. <laughs> 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 but – he is going to be Santa Claus at the coffee shop. We he, we're going to measure him tomorrow and order him this this pimp is Santa CRCC at in Kalispell. He is going to sit there for like three weeks before Christmas. Free pictures with the kids come in, get a hot chocolate, and the he's happier than a pig and shit. <laughs> so we're going to dress my fucking dad up as Santa Claus. Oh, Dick yeah. Dick Broom actual will be there. He goes. I was just he, I was just at the house with him. I was like, oh, I wish you guys would have told me I would have allowed my glorious beard to grow out for at least six months he's like it's trim but i'm doing the best i can I'm like what are you talking like giving it a motivational pep talk in the mirror Dude, he does have a pretty thick beard i've seen his episodes i have never here. seen him without at least a mustache he for my entire life his beard's one of the ones that start like right at your eyelid right there's no separation between his lower eyelashes <laughs> and his beard it's i don't i don't get it <laughs> michael can i get a water Hey, do uh, you want me to go grab it? Yeah, grab whatever you want. So, um, don't forget your headset. Yeah. So I had to make my rounds to my parents. Who'd you start with? I started. My mom was the first one. I told her um, I'm going to be on a cleared hot. She knows what it is. I was going to say, how'd you uh, how'd you preface the conversation with her? <laughs> so I said. <laughs> So I'm going to be on cleared hot and we're going to have to have a little talk. And she was like, oh my God, that's so exciting. And then she was like, for what? What do you mean? <laughs> and then I told her, uh, in 2007, I might've dabbled in some psychedelics and gave myself some pretty severe mental health problems. And I did it in secret. And I was like, oh, uh, my ride's here. And I went hunting for a week. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. And... I came back and she literally opened the door and she's like, we really need to talk. And I was like, okay, let's do it. And we sat down and we had about an hour and a half conversation and it was, yeah, it was brutal. I mean, she was very upset. We talked about the whole nature versus nurture. Like I did not want anybody in my family to think it had anything to do with them. Like I came from one of the best families you can possibly ask for. My decisions had nothing to do with how I was brought up. Yeah, that's fair. All right. So we're on a couch. There's a horse a, in the room. You have to pee, but can't. Yep. Tell me more. So I started convincing myself, like, oh, yeah, that's oh right. shit, did I die? You've died? I mean, my heart rate was probably at like 20 at this point. Like, I felt very at peace. And I was like, oh, maybe I died. And then I was like, oh, maybe I died and went to hell. Maybe this is what hell is, being stuck on a couch with a horse near your ear and you got to piss. And I'm like, people think it's fire and brimstone. This is way worse. <laughs> like, Truly. And I'm not a religious person. I believe there could, there's could be definitely more than past this full stop i don't I partake in religion it's almost um, agnostic you're not sure yeah i'm not sure i i think it's very <clears throat> i i believe that there could be no i believe there's a higher power i think there's something more than what we're doing but that's it and i don't pretend to know what that could be um so i'm paralyzed on the couch convinced myself i died and i'm literally thinking and i haven't told my mom any of this in detail either but I thought at some point I'm like, for now's all, the time, mom, to t go ahead and turn it off. Yeah, I told Skip her. Ahead. I told her I'd talk to her about timestamps, <laughs> and <laughs> I go. So I literally at some point, I'm like envisioning, oh, I could be. So I maybe I'm dead. For all I know, they're loading me in a stretcher in the driveway right now. My mom's outside crying, and it's the next day. Like I'm literally just thinking anything's possible at this point. I'm. It went that far. And so at some point I became kind of a little bit at peace with it. Like this is awful. I messed up, but it was a weird piece. And I kind of was like, I will do anything to get out of this. And if I get out of this, I'll start making right decisions. FYI, I didn't 
make any better decisions after this. <laughs> and out of nowhere, it was almost like the Kill Bill scene when she's in the car trying to wiggle her big toe. I mean, it literally was like, oh, shit, did my foot kind of move? And I'm like, I think so. And it, I mean, it was almost just like that scene. And and then all of a sudden, my whole foot moved. I'm like, oh, shit, maybe I'm alive. <laughs> and I would, in my mind, it probably took an hour to go from toe to sitting up on the couch. But for all I know, it was 15 minutes. But it got to the point where I literally, I sat up. I went and took the longest piss of my entire life. And I just kind of sat there like, what just happened? Um, went and woke up friends and were like, you have no idea what I just experienced. <laughs> and it was it was wild. Um, the next like week was just a lot of, a lot of what's life. This is wild that you can have this kind of experience. Like deep existential questions. Like putting it mildly, like just crazy existential, like thoughts and questions, things I never knew that people even had. So immediately out of the gate, I'm like, Oh, this is different. I wonder how many 17 year old kids are having these kind of thoughts, but it wasn't, I wasn't yet like, Oh, did I break my brain? It was kind of like, Whoa, I have a new perspective I haven't had before. And it was kind of the point where I was, I almost was like, it, it didn't give me less of an ego. It almost increased it. Cause I'm 17. You thought you were somehow enlightened. Yeah. I, I kind of was, and I wouldn't, I wasn't even talking to anybody about it because I thought they would, think I was crazy. I mean, I would jokingly be like, Oh dude, I thought I died. And I would joke about that and not telling it them, Hey man, I'm having some wild thoughts about shit. Like you don't want to know what I think life could be. Um, and yeah, and a little bit like, okay, this is new. And after like a week or two back to just parting, um, dabbling in some other psychedelics. Do you, are you familiar with Salvia? No. So Salvia was, is an, is a natural plant that you could smoke that gives you, I mean, pretty big hallucinations before you got into the salvia had that that period of time where you were thinking more existentially had that waned or gone away before or did you just layer that on top layered it on top because it wasn't i wasn't afraid of what i was thinking yet like i wasn't it was just like a new optic. it was just a new very deep uh very deep thoughts about life and existence in general that i didn't have before but not in a bad way yet um so i layered that on with some i mean and so salvia's got different grades. It's got at the time somehow it was legal to go buy in the tattoo shop in my town. Michael, I think, we I, think I think up? since I think since is. it's illegal, um, at the time it was legal. You could if you're eighteen, you could walk in and buy a salvia and it ranged from like it'd be called I don't even remember what it was, but like two X and it would go up to like ten X or what I don't even know what it was, but there was a, a spectrum of dosages that you could hallucinate more. I had done the medium one a few times or the small one a few times, did a medium one once. And it was literally just more of like a low grade, if I had to guess mushroom, because I'd only, I've only done mushrooms once and it was heroic dose. I haven't done a low grade of mushrooms. This salvia, was it just a visual type thing? Yeah, more like just colors seem different. And uh, I remember we'd call it uh, salvia pressure because you'd feel it on your skin. You'd kind of, your skin would be a little tingly huh. and you'd feel like this pressure. Um, laugh, you'd get the giggles. I mean, it was just, it was kind of like a probably happier weed if I had to guess. Huh. Herb from the Mint family. Brief, intense psychedelic experiences. Forms of long history views. Indigenous shamans in Mexico. Huh. Okay. So with this one, I probably did this like four or five times. In a close time period? Um, over the course of probably two months. <clears throat> and I did the small to medium one a few times. And then eventually we're like, oh, let's try the big one. And let's see what happens. So... We do that. Uh, multiple people did that. And when I did it, so this is the only one I remember researching. I think we heard some upperclassmen had done it. That's how we heard about it. And he said, everybody turned into two-dimensional South Park characters. And I was like, oh, that sounds kind of fun. <laughs> Fun's a sliding scale in terms Again, for each person. Stupid 17-year-old. Uh, totally, yeah. <laughs> and uh, I remember researching. We sat around the computer and went, Effects of salvia, and a list came up. And actually, Michael could probably do it. One of them on the list said, "Become an inanimate object." And I was like, "Huh?" So what? You just turn into a lamp? Like you smoke this shit, and you just stand straight up, and you're like, "I'm a lamp now." Huh. That's what I was guessing. So 
funny thing why I remember it so vividly is because I did become an inanimate object, but it was totally different than I had expected. Um, this was the only one where I, I smoked it and I was in a dream state before exhaling. Like I don't remember exhaling it. Instantaneous. Instantaneous. I took, again, <clears throat> my mom won't be listening because I'm time stamping all this, but I took the biggest bong rip I could possibly take of it, held it in, don't remember exhaling. I was immediately thrown into a complete dream state. Um, with no visual of like the world. So kind of what I thought, I thought mushrooms would do that. I was aware of my surroundings the whole time on mushrooms. this just put me in a dream and my dream, it was like immediately I just kind of was like looking around and I look left and right and there's millions of me as far as that I can see in both directions, none in front of me, just on the side. And I start feeling like a huge pressure on my face in a like weight of like moving and i determined i think that i'm making up the molecules of a shoe right now that was my feeling i was like hmm i think me and everything i am is just millions of me and i'm making up the molecules of shoe and somebody's walking with me right now that was weird <laughs> to say the least and it was kind of like it was and I don't know if you're, do you know Ari Shafir, Rogan's friend? Ari? I know who he is. I've never met him. So the first time I ever, in, so again, 07, never researched shit. I'm doing some stupid stuff. I've never heard anybody else having these experiences. So I remember one time Ari Shafir was talking about his salvia trip. He's, he became a fish in a, somebody's pond and lived a whole existence as this fish. On that one trip. That's how time works when you do it. So for me, I literally thought like forever I might have been making up this shoe. And I know this is wild shit. I mean, looking back, talking about it like this, like I'm not a fan. I never wanted to talk about this shit because it sounds fucking crazy. Like I know that now as somebody who's been removed from it for a decade, who hasn't done anything. That's one of the biggest parts of not wanting to talk about this stuff. I was a dumbass. This shit is definitely embarrassing to be admitting, but I sole reason I'm here. I kind of want to say fuck it. And let people know what can happen. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, molecules of a shoe, which was wild to see millions of yourself around you in pressure. And apparently there was a video. I wonder if somebody still has it, but I was on all fours, just pushing my head into the ground. And I think they said it lasted about 30 minutes and it took probably 10 minutes to come fully out of it. Like it was like a transition back to reality where I was like, Oh, I see everybody. And then it was kind of like fading back into that and then back out until I was finally out of it. Um, but then in classical fashion, didn't change anything. Chalked it up to another wild experience that probably not many other 17 year olds were having in my eyes. I'm sure all over the world, there's been kids experimenting with this shit and having the same thing. Another reason I want to talk about it because I listen to a lot of podcasts. I have never heard anybody talk about it like the way I am. Um, so coming out of it, yeah, that was my experience. And then, so in, I'm trying to map this all out like really well in my book. It's harder to talk about in person because yeah. I've never talked about it. This is my first podcast. Listen to myself in the ears. It's tough. In the book, like I wrote a thousand pages in the coffee shop today. And it's nice being able to write a thousand pages or a thousand th words, thousand words. I was going to say you're very <laughs> efficient very writer. Today. <laughs> One word per page. <laughs> no, a thousand, thousand words. And it's so nice being able to actually like think about it and put it into an articulate fashion. Like it's, I got the whole idea from your podcast. You, I don't remember who the guy was, but he was an author. And he said, I think one of the most important things somebody could do is write chronologically their entire life from start to finish. He said it was, it's super therapeutic, mm -hmm. cathartic. Do you remember who, who that was? No. And I, I, that has stuck with me. I'm like, that would be a cool exercise. And I made that an exercise in, in this challenge thing I was doing this one, one time. And I started writing about, I was going to write start to finish my life. And in the mapping out my mind process of how to do that, because I've never written anything. I'm like, what do I do when I come to this point? Like, do I leave it out? Because I was never going to tell anybody. Like, how do I put this on paper? God forbid somebody sees my laptop and hears me talking like this. But then I went, oh, shit this is probably the most important thing I could possibly talk about. And then it went into, Oh shit, I probably only should be writing about this from start to finish. That's how this whole thing happened. That's why I messaged you. Cause I literally was like, I'm not a writer. It's a pipe dream to think I could get it published, 
but it's fun. I'm in, I'm in a goal oriented phase of, I'm going to do whatever I can to achieve the stuff I want to do. Maybe I write 60,000 words and it doesn't get published, but I guarantee you I'll feel better when it's done. Self-publish it, man. We, I mean, that's well, I don't know anything about any of this, so I don't even know Neither do I. what that is. But I bet you, if you put in to YouTube, how do you self-publish a book? Yeah. You're going to get more hey, chat GPT. Can you publish? <laughs> I don't think chat GPT can publish it for you, but it could probably give you some insight. But I yeah. guarantee if you go onto YouTube and put in, how do you self-publish a book? Mm-hmm. You'll have more videos than you have time to watch. Yeah. So that's kind of how it all stemmed as I wanted to map it out. But so continuing on after the salvia, still being a dumbass, partaking in the same kind of stuff. I wasn't doing a lot. Like I, I literally did the heroic dose mushrooms, did some salvia. And then the thing that actually broke was weed. And I try and I'm in the book. I'm, I think I'm going to kind of explain it. Like, I don't know quite yet the metaphor, but mushrooms were almost like the bomb. Salvia was like the fuse. And then because of the framework, those gave my mind this one specific moment I smoked some weed that was probably the first time I'd smoked high grade weed, not some like junk out of like a monster can. Yeah. It, it broke my brain. And I mean, as a defining moment as a pair of pliers cutting a piano string, like snapped instantaneous, instantaneous. I mean, I can remember it literally like it's yesterday and this is 16 years ago. Um, before you get into it, Michael, do you even understand the reference of smoking out of a monster can? I have never done that. (laughs) Do you know what that is? Yeah, I know what okay. you're talking about, but I've never done that. Oh, do you? Describe it. Dude, I could turn this into a pipe in about two okay. seconds. <laughs> I know what you're talking about. I'm curious if the young man. Yeah, so you open the top, yep. put a little hole in the bottom. I don't know where you put the weed, somewhere in there, and light the weed. And Fucking rookie. I'd show you, but I don't want to give any kids ideas. I know. <laughs> kids these days. You can do it out of I an could, apple I as could well. make this a smokable pipe and probably under... 20 seconds yeah, if, especially you me a, a, if you give me a, a knife pan. yeah <laughs> <laughs> so that i mean that's literally how i was doing it and then like this one time at this party the token weed guy who wants to smoke sure first time taking like i think really high grade weed out of a bond unless it was laced with something i don't think it was looking back at the time i thought it was laced with my reaction to it yeah i think it was 2023 weed in 07 like yeah. i think it was some high grade shit um but it was like the classic case of people who get paranoid when they smoke, like I think that's a pretty common thing. A lot of people don't feel good if they smoke too much weed. Um, it was that, but it, I started really like thinking about the trips, the mushroom trip and the salvia trip and like more existential stuff while high. Um, and yeah, it was a bad weed high, but it was bizarre because I, I removed myself from the party and I was in a room trying to like get better by myself so I didn't have to deal with anybody. And and I'm not going to mention any names or even really give too much context because I don't want anybody to think yeah. they, they broke my brain. But I heard one person say one comment and it had to do with me in a negative light. And looking back, it wasn't even egregious at all. It was just a negative... It was a 17-year-old being a smartass probably. It was, yeah, talking shit. And I was so naive and had so much ego going at the time that it was the first time in my entire life, like the moment I heard the sentence, it snapped me out of my body. And I looked at myself for the first time in my life. And I literally hated every single thing about me. I mean, it was that dramatic. It was that drastic. Like it wasn't like hallucinating where I was literally like looking at myself. It was just the stripping of the ego on like a massive scale where I, I could see, all of my behavior, my personality, looks, the way I talked, the way I walked, hated it across the board. Which, that's weird. Like, I don't like, it sucks to admit. I mean, that's the kind of shit you don't want to admit when this kind of stuff happens to you. Yeah, but to put it into context of who you were at the time. You were 17. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. You're barely a functioning monkey yeah. at that point, let's be honest. Yeah, and when you're 17 and having those kind of thoughts, it's like, dude... You it's have no idea how long life is going to be. No clue. Like, the aftermath was wild. I mean, it was like one day, pretend you, I mean, are pretty confident. The next day, you're a different human being. Like, don't want to go do the same stuff. You don't want to leave your house and hang out with people. I mean, 
instantly low self-esteem, hated myself, like gnarly. In that moment. Gnarly social anxiety the morning after, in that moment. I mean, the moment that happened, I immediately had like the worst social anxiety and uh, low self-esteem immediately. Like that's how much your ego can be stripped if you fuck around with this kind of stuff. Um, And it was jarring. I mean, it was like, it was shocking the next day to wake up with a completely different way to look at life and experience life. I mean, it was wild. I wouldn't wish it on my, like literally, like I would take a potato peeler to my worst enemy. No, that's actually not true. I would wish what happened to me to my worst enemy for sure. But I would not wish that on any kid. I wouldn't wish that on any adult. Like it was bad. Um, like the next morning it was like business as usual for everybody else. I think I could look back and see nobody else thought anything was different. I, this is all just stuff. So this I was brought all, on myself. It was all an internal monologue that you were struggling completely, with. completely. I just now was looking at myself for the first time. Would you describe it as that? Or were you looking at yourself in a hypercritical manner that probably nobody could survive that magnifying glass? Well, it was both. I'd never looked at myself in general. And then I was looking at myself for the first time and it was hypercritical. Um, and, and from that, like I didn't want to do anything, but I immediately realized I fucked my brain up. Um, and I immediately was embarrassed and ashamed that I was thinking that way. And I would, couldn't fathom telling my parents that I was doing what I was doing and that caused what happened to me. I mean, it was, it was gnarly. Um, and I mean, you can only imagine what that's like. like. I don't know how much you can imagine. Like you haven't done any psychedelics. So, but waking up every day and then, and then you start the existential thoughts were happening even like harder after that. I'm like, now I really don't know what life is like not only was I questioning existence, but now you're like, you're having these wild things. Like what if life you're thinking, Oh, maybe I did die on that couch. Maybe this is just like purgatory or maybe this, and nothing of it is stuff I believed. It was just like, what ifs it was constant. What ifs like, what if this is what life is? What if this is what life is? What if this like, and it was just constant. Did you have any control over that inner monologue or it would just come at you like a tidal wave? Um, if I drank alcohol, yeah. I it would just come at you? Look, look in, no, no, it, it would take it away. Oh, interesting. Yeah, it so, would kind of mute so it? So like I said with the guitar, like alcohol has always been a very, which sucks for people who have bad, very good thing for me. Like I enjoy having a drink. Like it just literally just makes me happier immediately. Um, and at the time, it was the easiest way to mask. And like, I look, you look back and yeah, it was a coping mechanism. Like I was masking my problems by drinking because it made me feel better, but it was hard for me to dwell on stuff if I was getting drunk with friends. And I, I ended up still hanging out with friends quite a bit, even though I did not want to, because you don't want to be perceived as something different happening. I mean, you've talked about people with mental problems that wear it on their sleeve Mm -hmm. or, they only show some people and then you have the people with a mask. And when I say mask, I have explained this to my mom. I mean mask in like the biggest sense of the word where nobody knows you're going through what you're going through. Nobody. Like as far as I can tell, nobody had an inkling what I was going through. Um, How hard was that to present that to people? It was the hardest. I mean, it, like. Because you clearly <clears throat> knew you weren't feeling that way. So you were putting in effort to try to present that you had there was no change it that's all you could think about when you were with somebody that you don't want them to see what you're feeling and sometimes like i compare it to not only was it a mask but it was like a a mask made out of like lead from a dentist and almost in real time you could be talking to somebody and you could feel this wave of depression and anxiety coming on where it literally was like weight on my face that I was like, oh shit, my face is like going to melt off with anxiety. I should probably remove myself so this person can't see it while I'm talking to him. Like that's how. And you had none of these feelings or experiences prior to going. I mean, not even a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. Not even a little bit. I mean, so naive. Like, do you see yourself in other people at all? Like, like, do you have the ability, do you have the ability to like, 
people you're fans of or people you see like see a little bit of your personality in people and be like, oh, I can relate to that person. I think they kind of experience this like me. Hmm. Do you ever have that at all? I don't think so. So I have the ability to kind of like, I mean, I'm a fans of people who do cool shit. Like I listen to podcasts. Like, so I've seen like Brian Callen, like the silliness of Brian Callen. I'm like, yeah, that was probably kind of me in high school. I was a fucking silly dude. And it was kind of like super naive and goofy and never had any problems. I mean, super happy. Like for all accounts, Brian Callen's probably one of the happiest, funny, goofiest dudes I've seen. And I kind of was that free and just like loving life. I mean, I really had no before. issues before. Yeah. I was talking to him on the way to the coffee shop today. He's, oh, really? he's the silliest of gooses. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, that, and like, I mean, this is a tough subject to be on here talking about. I still have that. Like, you get a drink in me, like, we're going to have a good time. I'm pretty, pretty silly. This is just a heavy <laughs> topic to be talking yeah. about. Um, and yeah, I mean, it completely changed. You say a heroic dose. Mine was abrupt with the mushrooms, but it, after that third one, like it was a staged thing. Like it was those three stages. And then the I heroic like, dose personality change caught up in that one moment and hit, I, came crashing down. I feel like the other experiences you had, the mushrooms and salvia, and again, mm-hmm. no knowledge, but listening to you describe this, it seems like it may have, it, obviously it was cumulative. Mm-hmm. And it seems like it set a condition for you that with whatever you got your hands on with that weed, and it could have been just super high THC dose, yeah. that- Maybe, I don't know, maybe the other two experiences or the other experiences open the window, but the weed, you jump through it or the door, whatever yeah, yeah. metaphor you would want to use. Yeah. Seems like it was certainly the precondition. That's why I think, I think the mushrooms were the bomb with the ideas of what life could be. And then it was like the salvia happened and then like that weed just lit the fuse and that bomb blew up. I mean, it just, or if you want to do like a plant metaphor, it was like mushrooms were the seed, salvia was the water, and then it bloomed with yeah. the weed. I mean, it was a... It was 100% a three-step process, and each one of those, I know for a fact, was directly related, especially that last moment, just ignited all the feelings I had before. Well, the fact that you can remember precisely when it happened, I would certainly say that was the fuse. Oh, like photographic memory of this whole time frame. I mean, I could tell you from the moment I woke up in the morning that next day to the next, I mean, two years, there was no progress. And like you talk about like going through buds and like... Doing the thing where you wake up and take every day. I'm going to get yeah. through today. That's to achieve like a goal. Yeah. Um, that that wasn't to make it through no. fucking life. No, but when you you guys talk about all these like impactful things people should do to get through stuff, I was accidentally doing that then. Yeah, I would wake so for a long time, and I admitted this to my mom because she was like, "Did you ever think about killing yourself?" And I said, "Okay, one night I was lying there, and I can remember like it was yesterday. The thought entered my mind." And I went, if I'm going to feel like this for the rest of my life, I should probably just end it. And it immediately was followed by, mm, I could never do that to my family. Like, and it immediately came out. Most people aren't that lucky. I chalk it up to thank God I was so embarrassed and hard headed that for some reason that wasn't an option. But I have so much empathy that if anybody went through this, like how that could happen. I mean, I can completely see how that could happen. Yeah. So um, it immediately went out. But did you ever see the movie Into the Wild with the true story of the guy who went to Alaska? Yes. Ended up eating the berries and shit in the trailer. Yep. So that movie came out when I was in high school and it was about a year or two before that happened. And uh, Do you know they had to move that trailer from where it was because fuck sticks kept trying to go like, camp in it? It's so stupid. <laughs> <laughs> so stupid. <laughs> so I seen that movie like two years before my experience. And after that, after I was like, well, I'm not going to kill myself. That's not even an option. I never even entertained it. It was just kind of like... <clears throat> If I'm going to be like this forever, then I should probably end it. But then it immediately was like, nope, can't do it. But then realistically for like two months, I was playing around with the idea, should I just leave a note and leave forever with the hopes that someday I'm fine and would come back? Like that was a legit thing for about two months. Was the reason for leaving because you were exhausted by putting on the mask that you were wearing? What did you think that you would have, would be able to accomplish if you had left? All, all of it was stemming from gnarly social anxiety. Like if I was by myself doing something i wouldn't feel bad so you were gonna go straight school bus in alaska and- no no i didn't know what i was gonna do i was just like what if i left a note and i like just drove and kept driving and just where would that take me and then i don't have to see the people in my immediate vicinity who would judge me for being different i think it was along those kind of lines let's play a fun game of how far do you think you would have gone if you would have done that 
Oh, well, I never even got, I mean, I never even got that far. It was but just, I'm saying at 17, it, you're like. It was a fantasy. Every time I'd go by I-5, I was like, I should probably just get on this fucker and just keep going. <laughs> I never thought like, where would I go? How would I go? It was just yeah. a legitimate like, like maybe this is a call that I should try to make. It was a, probably a pressure relief or a stress relief. Yeah. It was just kind of like, uh, is being like, what am I going to do? Like this shit sucks. And eventually I was like, no, I can't do that to my parents either. And so that's when it started with like, I think I'd probably been three months into it by this point. I started realizing every morning I'd wake up, I'd be like, fuck, the world's the same. <laughs> and you go, and I'd just think nothing around me is changing. Like this is for the foreseeable future. This is going to be what it's like. So let me take every single day by day and just try to make it through it. And that's what I did for the next four years. And it, for a year and a half, two years, it was just like this, no progress. And it was just fighting through it. Um, I mean, nobody knew. I would love to see and hear any buddies who talk about it if they ever saw anything. Because as far as I know, they haven't. I ran this by two of my best friends. You're talking about people who knew you back then? Yeah. yeah. I ran this by two of my best friends. They had no idea. They're like, when I told them I was coming on here, one of my buddies is also a fan. He was like, he was all, can I come with you? I was like, fuck no, you're not coming with me. <laughs> Super gay. Can we sit in the same airplane seat? Dude. He's like, what, dude? I want to come. I was like, absolutely not. <laughs> I want to meet Michael. <laughs> And, uh, Who doesn't though? Yeah, right? yeah. I mean, and so, yeah. So I t- I ran it by them. They were the first ones I told it like deep, 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 and it gave them the full the full story. And they were like, "Dude," and because I kind of wanted to run by them. Hey, man, I'm gonna go do this. And I thought, do I just talk about my feeling after it happened? And I said, but I told them the full context of the stories, just like I just told you. I go, or, do, or should I have to? Should I go in detail because it's pretty gnarly to admit and they're like you have to tell it in detail yeah because it's hard i don't think people could realize what could happen unless you hear that that's what could fucking happen on psychedelics and so you could definitely see how i could possibly have those feelings after because of those experiences so yeah i ran it by them and they're like we had no clue no clue i'm like that's what i thought i mean that was the goal is i had a mask and i had a pretty good mask so when you talk about knowing people with it on their sleeve or if you show it to some people but not others and then you have people that have a mask and I'm like, I'm so far removed from it now where I'm like waiting for somebody on a podcast to talk about it the way I want to talk about it or the way I've wanted to hear people talk. I think I messaged Rogan like six years ago and I wasn't even talking about being on it, but I, I messaged him six years ago and I was like, hey man, you're always talking about psychedelics and its positivity. I'm like, you should find a normal dude who maybe it hasn't happened to. And I literally just left at that. I didn't get a response, obviously. But I wasn't even fishing for like me. I just had been listening to so many podcasts. I've just been waiting to hear somebody talk about something that would resonate with me and like give me a little bit like, okay, it's happened to other people. And I never have. Why do you think that is? I don't know how many people are as far removed from it as I am. Like I am uncomfortable talking about it right now for sure. Well, you might be far removed, but you certainly can't be alone in your experience. That's why, I mean, that's, the whole point of this entire thing. I do not like admitting this whatsoever. It's super uncomfortable, but somebody should be talking about stuff like this. And I don't, I don't know why it's not. And guess what? Anybody who is a fan of psychedelics and mushrooms are going to go, Oh, you did it wrong. You moron. I know I'm admitting that. I know that you should do it with people who are experts. You should do it in a good setting. I'm not here trying to say, I know anything about psychedelics. I'm just saying I did them wrong. This is what can happen. People have PTSD. Like I, dude, I'm such a big proponent of veteran health and veterans. I didn't serve, but I have a lot of empathy to mental health. So I never served. I try to get involved and contribute. That's my way of serving. I regret not serving, not regret in like a, I'm pissed at myself, but like, I wish I would have at the time. I would say about 22 when I came out of it, probably would have been the best decision for me when I found myself at 22, like being like, I made it through that. Holy shit. Probably the best thing I could have done was go into the military and come out of it with the money to go put myself through a good education. But instead I just spun my wheels for a while. I mean, I spent most of my twenties just dreaming about stuff I wanted to achieve. I've spent the last five years like trying to action it. Um, it would have been the smartest thing for me to do is go in the military. I was a lost kid at 22 didn't know what I want to do. Still don't. 
at 33, I know that I'm working in a cubicle and never thought I'd do that in a million years, but I'm very aware that that job gives me everything in life in terms of healthcare, retirement, um, support and security for my wife and my kids. And like more so now than ever, it's like, I see that. And because of what I've been through, call it like resilience or discipline and doing stuff I've done recently, I'm okay if the next 20 years I'm in a cubicle because I know that if I put in work and discipline in the margins of a husband, father, work, dude, there's a lot you could fucking do in those margins. A lot. And that shit's hit me hard in the last two years. Like I've been, I've done a lot of cool shit in the last two years. And I've just been like, I've just been leaning into it. And so if I'm at that kind of point where I feel that way, even though this is super uncomfortable to talk about, it was just too important to me to not be the person to do it. I think, you know, you say you did the psychedelics improperly. Mm -hmm. I mean, what guarantee is there if you do go to a professional, a guy who's a plumber Monday through Friday and on Saturday and Sunday, his name is Ashwanga and he takes you through a fucking ceremony (laughs) and then maybe you get, you know, uh, tree root root tattoos on your (laughs) neck and arms because you connect with nature, hypothetically. Yeah. Um, Who's to say, though, that it wouldn't have that impact on you? You know, and I think that's the dark side of only p- focusing on these amazing changes that people have had, which I don't – I've seen them firsthand in people. Mm-hmm. I have watched the, – the culture I came from is heavily alcohol-influenced. I was yeah. going to say based, let's say influenced. Yeah. You won't find it anywhere in doctrine. Actually, what I tell you in doctrine is don't get a DUI, fucker, <laughs> but – uh kegs in the courtyard yeah. Friday at noon and the last person uh, you know the first person to leave is a bitch and you'll be your picture's going to be taken put up on the court at Equal. if you don't drive yourself home you're a pussy <laughs> so it's like this is I'm not an expert in messaging but these appear to be conflicting yeah um, the, and for me I don't think I have an addictive personality mm-hmm. I enjoy drinking from time to time I've drank less I mean, I'm getting older now I just turned 46 um, <clears throat> but I also I, I love jujitsu I love being active. I love hunting. I love exploring everything that Montana has to offer. It's just you drink and you're like for 72 hours, you're not going to be at your best. Mm -hmm. Um, But I can turn it on and off. Like I don't miss it at all. And I enjoy it when I participate. But for me, like the set in setting now, like super close friends around a bonfire. Fuck yeah. Let's have a bottle of wine. Like bring it. And then after that bottle of wine, go get that case. (laughs) (laughs) And then we'll the best pairing, of course, with a nice red wine is whiskey because the same tasting notes. It's like, who fucking cares? You can't feel your face anyway. Um, But I know some guys who, fuck, we're talking drinking in the morning to function Mm. and uh, drank themselves to death as soon as they got, and, and as soon as they got out. But they took the habitual nature and the cultural nature and maybe it's changed since I, you know, I've been out for over ten years now, and I hope that it has. And at the same, you know, in the same breath, I'll say the camaraderie developed from some of that. Mm-hmm. I understand it's a double-edged blade, sword, however you'd want to describe it. There was some positives derived from that for me personally. I can see how it could fuck other people if they had an addictive personality. Yeah, you know, alcoholism is certainly can be uh, genetically. You can be genetically predisposed to it. And I have seen some people who were so deep in the bottle that they were drowning and they never touched it again as soon as they went down there. And But if you focus on only that, you're leaving out everybody. You can't be unique in the experience that you had, but you're leaving out everybody if you only highlight that particular aspect. That it can only happen if you do it the wrong way. Yeah. That's what you're saying. Yeah. I, I don't think that's the no, case. That's, and, and that's the whole point of, that I'm writing this stuff down. Like I have a disclaimer in the front. I'm like, I'm not a professional psychiatrist nothing like everything i'm saying is anecdotal i don't know anything but i do know i want to share this so that anybody finds themselves in that spot they at least have one person they're like well at least that i know that that can happen and oh he got through it okay maybe i can get through it how do you think you got through it like i said man i look back through that four year time and I was accidentally doing important things that got me through it. I was distracting myself with positive stuff, even though I'm not going to pretend at the same time I was doing bad stuff to mask it. Like the alcohol shouldn't have done that. Like mm-hmm. if I knew I probably would have got over it in two years if I knocked the alcohol out of it 
and went sober and just knew that I should be focusing on that kind of stuff. Or you might have driven yourself crazy by not being able to control your mind. Exactly. It was a complete freak accident <laughs> that I did things necessary to get over it. And it was, it was the incremental everyday thing, like, like the bud. I mean, it was like buds of life <laughs> to wake up that miserable and go, I'll just make it through the day. Life's not changing around me. That means the only thing that can change in the moment is me. I mean, I recognize that at 17 broken three, four months into this thing. I went shit. And every time I'd wake up and like, God damn it, nothing's different. This wasn't a dream. I'm in life. It just sucks now. And I would wake up and I'd go, all right, make it through the day. Next time, make it through the day. Also the mask is scary when you have a good mask because the mask is formed out of being so ashamed and embarrassed. That's all it comes from. If you are somebody with a mask that nobody knows, I can't think of any other reason you would have it other than being embarrassed about people's perception of you admitting a weakness. That's where I think it's born from. I think the people that I was telling my mom, I go, I get bummed when I see like a celebrity suicide and, and just cause I'm a big proponent of mental health and I feel bad when it happens like most people for some reason, one sat with me super odd last year and it was, uh, are you familiar with the dude Twitch that was on the Ellen show? He was like the DJ for Ellen, the black guy. I think he was like a dancing with the stars guy. Net didn't even know him. But from all accounts, I'm like, that dude, every time I've seen a picture of that dude somewhere, he was smiling. He's a dancer. And then I'm like, then I go to like his Instagram and it's like he posted like before it. He's dancing in a kitchen with his kids and his wife smiling. He shot himself in a hotel room then like the next day. And I have never seen by the outpouring of people talking about him, everybody seemed confused. I don't know if more stuff developed after. I think I followed it for like a month after. And from all I could see, nothing. And to me, he had he had a mask. Like he had the mask that nobody knew about. I came across, and it's escaping me right now what medium I saw this. It might have been an article, but it also might have been a YouTube video or just something on maybe even reels on Instagram. But it was a collection of people's last posts before they killed themselves. They were all overwhelmingly externally exuding confidence, happiness, teeth out, smile. It was it was eerie. What's well, uncomfortable? The, the mask that you're talking about. And that's the biggest reason that I want to do this. I mean, I've heard you talk about a buddy with a mask and it's like, those are the ones I worry. I want to give some context to, you're not going to know, man, like there's no way to know who those people are. So to me, the only thing you could do is put stuff out there that makes them feel like they're not alone. Yeah. That's the only thing I can think of that could help. Like I could have wrote in and done this as a 20 page full auto Friday Hey man, this is what I went through. This is what I experienced. That's too long for a Friday. Episode. <laughs> I, I would have got lost in the paragraphs and be yeah. like, oh, fuck it. I just don't, I don't think it would be as meaningful as some dude putting it out there. What did you notice first? You know, the, you described the first year and a half to two years as being the same. What was it that put you on an upward trajectory? Um, the gradual buildup of what I was saying, like I got super deep into playing guitar. Um, and the double-edged sword of the, that's what I was going to say. So the double-edged sword of the mask is it, it's forcing you to go do your normal things because you're embarrassed that somebody will think of something, think something if you're not doing it. So it was hard for me to stay home and start saying no to, I mean, I'd say no to some stuff, but I wouldn't say no to everything People would because know God forbid they're wrong. like, what's, ha, what's, what's wrong. So I was forcing myself to go do stuff and being miserable doing it. And that, unfortunately that helps to, to, Put yourself out of your comfort zone and keep doing stuff. Don't isolate. And it would one thing if I isolated and drank all the time. I mean, that would have been completely different, but thank God I was stubborn and embarrassed and kept doing stuff. But like the guitar, I would just play hours a day. I mean, I would focus on that. I got good. I'd play golf. I would just keep my mind occupied with stuff. Music was huge, man. I'd go to bed and talk about like thoughts before bed and having trouble sleeping. Dude, I'd go to bed. I would just think about this shit constantly. I mean, it would take me two hours to fall asleep. So my MO was, man, I just put earbuds in and just listen to music because it would drown out my thoughts and I could fall asleep pretty quick. And like, those were some tools I did to, 
to get over it and just gradually. And I remember, I think, it, yeah, it was probably two years in. I can't remember a defining moment for this, but I woke up one day and it was like probably 10 a.m. So I'd probably been up a couple of hours and I went, oh, shit. I haven't thought about how miserable I am today. <laughs> and it was literally that out of nowhere. Um, did you ever, do you read many like books like uh, Atomic Habits, like James Clear? Have you heard that book? I have read that book. I only just started recently reading, dude. I fucking I hate reading. I just <clears throat> lately have been reading as a goal that it's good to do. And I read the James Clear book, Atomic Habits, and he talked about something I, I keep thinking about constantly because I feel like it's so cool is he was talking about if you're in a, like a freezer and I'm going to butcher it, but if you're in a freezer and you put like an ice cube on a table, say it's negative 30 degrees in there and you just click it down, click it up one degree, nothing's going to happen to the ice cube. Then you click it up one degree, nothing's going to, well, eventually you're going to get to 32 degrees and you're going to click and it's going to just move and then click move. Dude, it's that with everything. Like, I loved how he put that because it's such an easy, digestible way to look at. Yeah, dude, all change that's worth something takes a long time. Yeah. I mean, it, it, you're not going to click at that one degree and be like, fuck, I'm still not good. I guess I'll quit. Like, it's like that with everything. And I can say that to pretend like I have discipline. I don't. I've just been working on it really hard even more lately because I know how important it is. I got busy with kids and work and family that I don't get to go hang out with friends as much as I used to. I don't get to do. And instead of like wallowing in oh shit, I don't have time for this. I just started trying to do stuff before they get up after they go down. Those are my windows to try to do stuff and stuff like that just helps me stay motivated. What time do you wake up in the morning? Over the last two years, most mornings I'm up at four forty-five. Chalk, I'd be very proud. <laughs> And I mean, I don't have, I have to be at work at seven. So seven thirty. So that's my, I mean, I could easily not do that and never work out and not be in good shape. But when you're busy, it's harder to, I could do that at night when the kids go to bed at seven thirty. but I'm so beat at the end of the day that it's hard to get the motivation to go out. I have a, you saw my page. I just yeah. I have a garage gym and I, that page was only built because I eliminated my social media. I recreated one because I hated social media. I recreated one and only followed people who are doing cool shit so that every time I open it up, I only see cool shit happening or deaths on bicycles or deaths on some people's <laughs> stories. <laughs> <laughs> and it just, that just keeps, it's hard to not want to do cool shit when you're just seeing people do cool shit. That's the power of social media. I was in, yeah. New, I was in New York yesterday actually, but the speech was two days ago <clears throat> and somebody was asking me about, it was a, a broader question, but it was about, uh, you know, the, all the bad things that are happening in the world. Mm -hmm. And they were referencing social media. And I, it's something that I think about quite a bit. And people forget that social media is a voluntary participation. Yeah. It's not forced on you. Mm -hmm. you. You know, the anxiety rectangle, which is absolutely what that creates for most people, to include myself. I'm not saying that I'm mm -hmm. uh, free of any of this stuff. But you have to control it or it will control you. So by doing what you were doing and selecting what you want to see, the positivity versus – I mean I recommend to people go onto a traditional media outlet and for an hour just make two tallies, positive story, negative story. You're mm -hmm. going to be fucking shocked yeah. at how many stories go into the positive bucket. Probably none. Maybe one in yeah. an hour. Then social media. If you don't control your input of information, you know, and your input is going to directly inform your output, yeah. but you can control and look and see things that motivate you versus things that make you think that the world is constantly coming to an end. And you can do that really easily. Like I found myself scrolling over stupid shit. Like I was just yeah. mindlessly scrolling or getting upset or emotionally which involved guess what? in stupid shit. I still do. Yeah. I, I will still mindlessly scroll, but every single thing I'm like, oh, that's a cool workout. I've never heard of that. Oh, that stretch would help. That's cool. I mean, I oh shit, that. stretching is for cowards, <laughs> but whatever. But like every time I'm scrolling, it's like mostly positive. I mean, yeah. sometimes I'll get on a tangent where it's like a funny meme, and I click on it. I'm like, huh. and then you Down scroll, the rabbit hole. and then you scroll, yeah. and then. But it's like I limit that because overwhelmingly, I'm only following people that do cool shit. I'm not following bike video. No, I'm just. <laughs> I think it's cool shit. <laughs> But you know what I mean. So I just can't like, believe how people's enthusiasm so often and so clearly outstrips their capabilities. Yeah. 
What made you think you could jump that 100 foot gap on your BMX bike? Who thinks they can take a <laughs> hairpin turn going 40? Apparently, a lot of people. Dude, and then they become I've, road crayons. And I've, it's just, I'm here for it. I've seen <laughs> like 15 people shoulder check a tree at like 30. Yeah. I love it. <laughs> Enthusiasm and capability are not always the same thing. You have to Were be you a big fan of Scarred, the MTV show, when I was out? No. You familiar? No. Oh, it was your version of your Instagram stories on steroids, and it was on MTV. Ugh. The lead singer of Papa Roach did it, and every episode was just bones sticking out of skateboarder's arms. See, I can't watch the skateboard ones. <laughs> I'm not joking. I'm going to start posting and tagging everyone. <laughs> I'll just scroll past it because <laughs> I can see the lead up of the guy getting ready to go down the stairs. I'm like, next, for whatever reason, the skateboard ones, because you're going to get this angular distortion almost every time. I'm I mean, out. Comp they were showing compound fractures on MT. I'm like, what? I just want to see people just seriously dirt crayon <clears throat> down the path, obviously unconscious with protective gear exploding. And then it just snapshot into the next one. And yes. it just ends right at the moment of impact. And <laughs> yes. Instagram, if you could help me with actually my feeds. I think perfectly curated. Dude, so sometimes my wife and I will lay in bed at night and I'll just be like go through reels and she'll make it for 15 seconds. <laughs> and it's the same comment every time. Dude, how what the fuck is wrong Dude, with you? How many couples <laughs> surf Instagram reels in the moments they go before bed? <clears throat> I would say that I'd say a lot. Most nights we're shoulder to shoulder and we're watching just some stupid shit. For 10 minutes and it's like okay night. my perfect setup would be a frenchy video a bike video <clears throat> probably like a water sport video of somebody detonating a jet ski and then another frenchy video and just kind of so it's the like frenchy's even all it's like one two one out. yeah then i just can rotate through it <laughs> dude so what i'm saying with the, the instagram and curating your own feed you have to control it you have to take a positive control approach to the information you're receiving and not everybody needs to do that but if you're somebody who wants to try to do better for themselves like if you have any goals of any kind pick what the goal is get rid of the bullshit and maybe follow people that are all surrounded in that goal like i don't it seems pretty easy to do i know it's hard yeah. like i know that's very hard how do you uh how do you recognize you were finally out of the woods so like when I said like 10 a.m., I was like, oh, I haven't felt miserable today. That's cool. Maybe I'm not. Maybe I'm getting better. It's then by and that was like two years in. And then it was like it was gradual. It was almost like that time stamp of 10 a.m. would just grow without being aware of it because I would just constantly be hit with the feelings of the social anxiety. Wasn't always happening, starting not to always happen when I was with people, talking to people. And it got to the point where it'd be like I'd be going to bed. I'm like, oh, shit, I didn't think anything bad today. It was that simple just from time i mean i don't want to say time heals all wounds because i was doing a lot of stuff accidentally that helped i don't think if you just sit there and dwell time's gonna heal it time wouldn't have healed that if somebody's in that tell somebody and go get help i should have a hundred percent just gone and got help but at the time that just wasn't an option for me how do you think your life would be different if you didn't have that experience i think about that pretty often I wouldn't have changed anything that happened to me I think losing the ego and being self-aware is probably the single biggest thing you could do as a person and I think that's why they talk about it so positively with the psychedelics because it strips away your ego but do you need to use psychedelics to no. do no no I think if you're I think you need to hear that you should be self-aware and you should try to look at yourself through the lens of somebody else and probably be aware. You should probably be a little critical of stuff you do. You probably shouldn't think you're the shit and have everything figured out because everybody's got to figure stuff out. We all do. But if you're just living in this like unself-aware bubble all the time, that's not good. Like I think one of the most important things you can do is be self-aware. Um, but you can go far on the opposite side of the spectrum with that. So yeah, I don't yeah. know what tools can you do to become more self-aware. I'm sure there's plenty. I think the first thing it, like most is admitting that maybe I've never thought about it that way. And maybe I should start trying to be a little more self-aware, but I don't know what tools there are to help people come to that conclusion. If they're not at all, I think you have to experience failure. Yeah, I would agree. And I don't, and I do not have a roadmap for people to do that. 
I mean, I, had, I would have some suggestions and it would be pursue things that the likelihood of success would be lower than you would maybe like them to be. Yeah. And failure, you know, not that I'm a fan of uh, Tough Mudder or anything. It's yeah. literally the first thing coming to my mind because I think mm-hmm. they do one up here. Sign up for something like that and don't make it to the end. Yeah. And then sit with why. Yeah. You know, and, mm-hmm. and again, as a f- super fucking broad example that probably doesn't apply to most people, I'll use that one. But there are other things that you could do for yourself that could put you into that place where failure is likely an option. And then you have to sit with the why mm-hmm. and look inward as opposed to outward. I would agree, but I picture a lot of people do that. And a lot of people get done and go, that was stupid. That was dumb. They don't take it for how it should be taken. Yeah. So, well, in the modern era, I think era, that's pretty common. Well, I think in the modern era, people are literally rewarded for looking for an external reason for their failure as opposed to an internal reason for their failure. Yeah. Their mechanism is going to be to look outward as opposed <clears throat> to inward, initially, at least. Does that help? Like when I say self aware, I mean, like, being a dick to people and, like, bad, like, classically bad, like, personality traits. Like, I don't even know how to articulate it. Um, Yeah, I'm just talking more along of personality traits. Like, I was a selfish person. Yeah, but you were 17. I would have kept being selfish. You sure? Maybe time would have healed it, but I just wasn't a very aware person. So I look, I'll look back at myself at that age and I can still, it's still, God, it fucking hurts. Some of the things that I said to people in high school, I still remember it. And I hope, I fucking hope that they have either forgotten about it or it was far less impactful to them than it is to me. Mm -hmm. But as far as the person that I want to be in life now that I'm 46 years old and the person that I was back then and the delta between the two, like I didn't have any recognition or realization of that. And I don't think many people do at that age. Okay. You know what I mean? I don't, I just, so I'm it, not giving myself enough grace for at 17 years behave. old. Let's be honest. It's yeah. like the gravitational pull in the universe begins with me. It ends with me. I care about me. What am I going to do? You know what I mean? You just think you're the, you, you don't even have an understanding of fucking time. Yeah. I guess I just remember how naive I was. I'm trying to think what would have been the you're catalyst. You're looking at that though, through the lens of where you are now. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I'm just trying to think what the catalyst would have been at like, say 23 if instead of learning it at, at 17 the hard way, what would have been a healthy catalyst for it when I was 23? I don't know what that would have been. I can't imagine what it, what that would have been. Is it just life experience? And just would something have triggered me to be like, oh, I'm... I would like to think that I am a better version than I was at 17. I'll leave it to people who... Anybody other than myself to make that judgment because they would have the most objective metric on it. Mm-hmm. I would like to think that I am a better person and I look back through it the changes that came in my life came from me making mistakes and having to deal with the consequences of it and having to own it and just lapse around the sun. Yeah. I mean, outside of that experience, I I mean, I've had a ton of challenging times after, but the coolest thing about making it through it is it has given me such a good framework to be able to overcome stuff. I mean, I literally feel like my brain's callous to feeling that way ever again because I I truly am happy about everything about life. I mean, not like, oh my God, I love everything. Yeah. Everything just has context now. Like, if the worst thing in the world happens, I literally think, well, there's definitely always something worse if I'm still here breathing. I was talking to a buddy and I go, they're like, yeah, but you just like pause. I go, dude, at all times, I know somebody somewhere is living way worse of an existence than I am. It's hard for me to complain when that's a constant just in the background. I'm not even thinking about it. It's just a thing now that is just always there. And they were like, yeah, that's not normal. And I was like, okay. Why isn't that normal though? Because they probably- When did that that become abnormal? Because I think a lot of people are just too caught up in, I don't know if it's social media. I think people always have felt like that 
you just need a different perspective. I don't know. I had to go through something extreme for me to have that. Yeah. I mean, it, it literally is a thing that's constantly like, and I'm not blaming anybody for overreacting to something bad and getting mad at stuff. I have, I'll, I'll do the same thing. I'm not pretending I'm just like fucking Confucius or whatever. Stuff will happen. I'll be like, oh, son of a bitch. Immediately, I'm like, is that a big deal? No. So I can move on pretty quickly. Yeah, from you that have stuff. a good framework for that. Yeah, it just helps. Like, I just have a good framework to get over shit. To the point where I'm sure my wife is, I, I know my wife has found it annoying over the years. And that's, I can name you every flaw today that I have that I am working on. I just am aware of flaws and I'm okay with them now. My biggest one, yeah, is okay. If my wife blows something up at a proportion that I think doesn't need to be, I should not have to jump and be like, it's going to be fine. Like, what's the big deal? Some people want their emotions to be heard at least. So I should probably be a little more empathetic and like entertain it for a second let her get it out then be like okay but if you look think about it like we're gonna we're gonna be fine i jump too quickly to the (laughs) we're fine what's wrong (laughs) i would say it's too quick it's too quick i would say just open with just to say hey you should calm down (laughs) that's a banger it's gonna solve a lot of problems you're blowing this out of proportion. <laughs> Say, calm down. You're blowing this out of proportion. And then I, you might want to run out of the room. I don't know your wife at all, but what does she think about you coming up here and talking about this stuff? Dude, nobody in my life can even wrap their mind around this. I mean, like I said, small town. As far as I know, anybody that I know or know or who they know have done stuff like this. It's just not in their wheelhouse to think why I would want to do it. They never knew this happened until, I mean, the first time I told my wife was my son. So that was four years ago was the first time I ever admitted that I had social anxiety and depression was four years ago. And that was to her because of what she went through. To be honest, I thought I'd go to my grave because I didn't see the need to ever admit it. But when she went through that and then I'm dude, a million other things. I mean, everybody went through a lot during COVID. Um, let me just give some context to like how I, where I started realizing that I had a different framework for the shit was in 2018. Uh, the car fire in Reading took out my mom's house. Mm. My dad almost died. They lost everything. Uh, fire tornado ripped through the neighborhood. Um, a firefighter actually passed away. Rest in peace. Jeremy Stoke right outside their neighborhood. I mean, it was like a fire tornado. I think it made national. Oh, it did. That went through my house. Um, my stepdad almost died in it. Like to the point where he was like stuck in the garage and the winds were so big, they were falling on his truck. But in the heat of the moment, he wasn't thinking just back through the garage door. So he actually waited to get it up, barely got out. My mom thought he was dead for 15 minutes because they were just, they had both had their cars, but he wasn't behind her. And the wall of flames was so big that she thought he was dead for like 15 minutes. She called me hysterical. Um, So that was like a first big thing. And I, I realized I was like, oh, through all that, I was able to be a rock for them in a way I didn't even know I could be. And I started realizing, oh, it's because I've gone through something terrible. I've experienced with this kind of stuff. And so I was able to kind of hold it together for them. Um, But then, like, fast forward, I'll just touch on it briefly. But ultimately, stepdad ended up committing suicide. Um, Two months before uh, COVID, which was terrible, because then COVID happened, actually a month before. So they didn't even get to celebrate his life till like eight months in. Um, and so that was another thing. I was able to be a rock for my mom. Um, even more stuff. My wife had some stuff on her side that happened. Um, scare with my daughter. You'd spend a time in UC Davis for four days, not knowing if she was going to make it. Like that was huge. Um, again, was able to be a rock for them. And I just over like five years, I was like, Oh, I have a different framework. Like, that I didn't even know I had until I just started compounding those bad experiences and knowing that, oh shit, I think I can almost get through anything. Like I don't, the worst stuff that would ever happen to me obviously involves my kids, like in my wife, I can't imagine. Um, but I have some kind of framework now that lets me overcome that stuff. And it's cool to think back and explore on how that came to be. Cause it wasn't always, and I still, it's not like I'm, resilient to everything. I mean, I'm, but I almost sometimes feel like I might be. 
And you equate that all to the experience that you have with psychedelics? One hundred. I ex- not the I experience you all- have with psychedelics. The impact that the psychedelics had on your brain, I should say. I equate it all to just what the aftermath was. I equate it all to making it through what I made it through. Maybe, and that brings me to like why I'm a big fan of veterans and their post traumatic stress and stuff. I see a correlation to all this kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. Um. And I just see that it's possible to make it through that stuff and you're going to be like, you can make it through the stuff. And I look back at making it through that hard time that I could, that I'm like, I, anybody probably could. I mean, I know there's different variations of depression, anxiety that manifest differently, but it's kind of all brain chemistry to me. And there's got to be ways to fix all of it. And I like exploring what that might be. Did your father-in-law leave a note? I mean, we were talking about masks, right? Mm-hmm. Obviously, you don't need to tell me. But I, I usually ask because the friends of mine who've killed themselves who didn't leave a note, like, how many fucking questions would you have, right? Count mm-hmm. with, it's like, can I just sit down and talk with you for fucking 10 minutes? Yeah. The ones that have left notes, I think the mask that you described, the weight of it is probably the best description. And it was so good that nobody really knew. And, uh, you know, there's a, I mean, a variety of reasons that people make that, uh, make that choice. But again, I just imagine that must've been, I don't, I don't want to know what was in the letter, but I'm assuming I'll tell you offline all about it. Like I'm, for ass- sure. I'm assuming there was some level of him wearing a mask to that, to some degree. That's where the conversation about mask came from with my mom. Yeah. Um, there was stuff, there was writing all over the wall. There wasn't a, there wasn't, was it visible or it was yeah. more visible to her. before to or her. after both. It always had some stuff, yeah. it, not, not to everybody. But well, it's like an iceberg, right? Did. About 90% is below yeah. water or 80%. But she thought that was a mask. And what I was saying was a true mask. What she was saying was a part-time mask. I'm like, no, mom, you're not understanding. Yeah. You knew. So that's not a mask. I mean, nobody knew or would have ever known. Well, not all masks are created the same. Yeah. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. They're, they're, some of them, you're like, oh, wow, you went to a Hollywood specialist. Nobody would have known because it's some Mission Impossible shit. <laughs> yeah. Another one's like, hey, did you put that lipstick on in the shower? Because yeah. that looks like shit. Are you shit. wearing a paper bag? <laughs> yeah. You look like you just, you know, fucking blew a lipstick container. It's all over your lips. <laughs> it's like, God, that sucks, man. But th- so that's one thing that sat with me, too. And like one of the biggest things, too, like I keep saying I am a fan. The whole thing people come, they're like, you're going to Montana Beyond. Like, how are you going to do that? I'm like, A, he's a dude. I'm more nervous that I'm going to have to talk about some heavy shit than I am meeting him, even though I'm a fan of you. Like, I don't look at celebrity like people are looking at fucking Taylor Swift and Travis Kelsey. Some people worship people for the sake that they're famous. Yeah. I know you're a humble dude who doesn't consider yourself famous, but in a world where somebody might create a better social media circle, the you, the Joe Rogans, the Evan Hafers, the Mike Glovers, I mean, I'm a fan of all those guys because I think all of you guys are doing great things and could truly help people more than you even realize. And I, I told, I told them, I'm like, if anything, I would just like to meet him and say, thanks for what he's done. But to give back even more from what I've learned from everything those guys have done, like, let me share this. And hopefully if one person goes, Oh my God, I've never heard it put like that. And feels maybe a little bit better. Literally if one message after this, that was all worth it. You'll get more than one message. It's a weird thing, man. We were talking offline. You know, I was down in uh, Bozeman where I was the recipient of this beautiful shiner, <laughs> the gentle art. <laughs> yeah. And I guess it's, it is the gentle art until it's not. Maybe yeah. people just don't add that part because it's yeah. a longer sentence. Um, <laughs> fuck. And uh, we're in a store and a guy recognized my voice from the podcast. And it's super – I'm appreciative of it because from my perspective, you know, Michael and I sit in this room and – have conversations with people and it gets reduced down to a file, an audio file and a video file. And you hit upload and I don't know where the fuck it goes. Mm -hmm. And for me, I'm, I just see myself, I wake up in the morning and I see myself in the mirror and there is absolutely fucking nothing unique or special about me. I am, I don't consider myself to be a celebrity. I have no desire for fame of any level. And I am, I, my life is riddled with problems. Yeah. You know, I deal with, I have good days and I have fucking bad days. And I'd like to say that I have more good days than bad, but the reality is I don't know. And I'm okay with that because Mm -hmm. I think that's, you know, like we had said earlier, life to me is not about the raining gumdrops in a field of unicorns with a a rainbow over the top. I don't, I don't think that's possible. 
Yeah, I don't think it's possible. I don't want that to be like that. But I am no different than anybody else. It's, you know. And I know that. But like people in my circle that knew I was a fan of the, are like, oh my, I'm like, dude, I, I'm more nervous to talk about what I'm talking about. Well, it's because you're talking about yourself and you're, yeah. and you are to a degree. And something I've never, ever talked about. Yeah. On so a it's platform gonna be that I've never done. Just a lot at once. Yeah. But I mean, I feel way better now, obviously at this point, but yeah, it's just, it's a heavy subject and I've been waiting forever to see somebody talk about it in the way that I want to. And I'm having a hard time articulating it as well as I want to, but that's where the book comes in. And like, yeah. whether or not that becomes something or not, I can think about it and formulate my sentences way better than talking to you on a podcast for the first time. Well, so, you have more time. You so don't yeah. have to do it in real time. Yeah. So I, that's what I want to do. I want to put it in order, lay it all out in a very tangible, entertaining way. Like I don't want it, I don't want it all to be serious off of this. I mean, I have the same kind of sense of humor you do. I have a dark sense of humor. I love joking. It's just a heavy topic, so you got to lighten it up a little bit. So I'm sure I'm going to put it more in my my true fashion, which will be not too heavy, but heavy when it needs to be. So even given your experience with psychedelics, which I'll say fell on the negative side of the mm -hmm. bandwidth, what do you say to people when they – or what would you say to people if they approach you and they go – Hey, I've heard this great stuff about it, and I'm curious. What would you recommend? Even though your own experience, mm -hmm. what do you tell people? I think first I would want to say why. If it's seriously somebody that would like never had done it, first ask why. And if it's just for the sake of the experience, I would say change why you want to do it. Like, if you want to do it because you have some goals and you see that you want to learn something, go into it with a good headspace. Just don't do too many. Do your research on what you should do if you try it. Make an informed I don't decision. Think, I don't think saying. anybody should try it. If you have mental health problems already, probably don't do it. Probably pass. Most people with mental health problems don't know they have them. <laughs> <laughs> That's not true. I knew I had mental health problems. Okay. That was post. Y Right. Yeah, but there's somebody. Some I'm people, just saying, some people who right now are like, maybe I do need to do psychedelics. Don't realize they're fucking crazy to begin yeah, with. Yeah, that's true. I guess there's different types of mental health because a lot of people are doing right now who have mental health problems, but it's fixing them. So if you think you don't have any mental health problems, go into it with a purpose. Don't do it because you just think it's cool and you want to do it. Research it, how you should do it. Set setting people. I would add intention to that. Intention. And this is from somebody who has no experience, yeah. but. And almost everybody that I've talked to, for it to truly be as impactful, there's the pre-work, like you're saying. Mm -hmm. Identify your why. That's actually really important for any goal in your life. Or yeah. Just it kind of like, why do I want to do this? I mean, yeah. Is it because I want to be insta famous? First off, pass on that shit. Yeah. I mean, unless that's your jam, and then no, you know, take pictures of your butthole and put it up there. I guess, <laughs> but that's what Michael's only fans. <laughs> that was Michael's route to fame. So, <laughs> but there's the before set setting. Like the Ibogaine stuff. What, these fuckers are hooked up. I don't up. know anything about that. I don't either, but what I do know in talking to them <clears throat> is that they are hooked up to shit. They have IV ports in. Like it is not, you know, like the Ashong. The, the Matrix. It's not the plumber <laughs> who on the fucking weekend throws on his yeah. amber crystal amulet and yep. then is like, and now I will show you the ways of the mystical medicine because I went to an online course. Maybe go to people who are going to hook you up to the EKG and have a doctor on standby. And then though- and in talking to people, there was a diet leading up to it. There yeah. was there was the journaling to identify the intent and goals. Then you go through it under observation. Then there's all the after. If you can lay all that stuff out, it probably can have a great impact. Yeah. But to ignore the fact it could potentially have something happen like it happened to you. Mm -hmm. Granted, you uh, were doing the fullback dive approach, as most 17-year-olds do. literally <laughs> did everything you should not do. I mean, literally to a T. But even if you do everything that you sh should do, in air quotes, yeah. not talking about the risks associated with it, mm -hmm. I think is dishonest at best. And that's what's been bumming me out for like five years. Not bumming yeah. me out because I see that it's doing good work and I believe it is, but I'm like, God forbid a military veteran with PTSD goes to do that and it does what I said and it cuts a wire and it starts giving him an existential thought that who knows, maybe I died over there. 
this is purgatory is that I have to live with my actions. Like, I don't know. I don't know what can happen. And it's not all sunshine and rainbows. I mean, I think it, I think it's really hard to have the experience I did with doing it right. Like, I think that's kind of hard to do from what I see. Not impossible though, but, but I, I don't, but I don't but know it's if never it's never talked about. Yeah. But I don't know if it, if it's impossible for that to happen on a low dose. I, I don't know. From my understanding of some of the shit that these guys go through, it is the opposite of low dose. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I don't, dude, I don't know. That I, Ibogain stuff, man, they're talking 12 to 24 hour ride. No, thanks. No, thank you. Fuck. I'm pretty sure my first mushroom one was like six to eight. And that was enough because it felt like a year. <laughs> my favorite part of your story was that you thought there was a horse in the room. That's usually, so when you're telling that around the campfire, like yeah. all my buddies know that one because that's a fun one that gets laughs when you're hammered, jokingly just, telling that, yeah, dude, I died on the thing and I had a fucking horse in my ear going. <laughs> I just logistically am trying to figure out, did it open a sliding door? Is this a doorknob? Was I it imagine, a round doorknob or a handle? I imagine it was a double hung window and it stuck its nose in my ear through the window. <laughs> Horses are such assholes sometimes. They probably would. <laughs> but I mean, dude, it's wild shit. It's not fun to talk about because people who don't know anything about them it's so confusing. Like people in my family, I mean, for all I know, my dad and stepmom could have partake, but like my mom and grandparents, beyond them. Like there's no, that's like a quantum physics person yeah. trying to teach me. Like the, I don't understand it. I'm not going to understand it. So it's tough to admit how crazy those stories were because it makes you sound crazy, but that's the power of that shit. And guess what? psychedelics just mess with the mind and make you think differently. You have wild dreams all the time. So it's all just brain chemistry, really, at the end of the day. Yeah. It's just throwing you in a, it's just throwing you in an almost dream state. Well, it's probably finding a gear for most people's brain that they didn't know that they had. Yeah. But if you're not prepared for that shit, you might drive right through the wall. Yep. Yeah. It's, I just think it's too important to not talk about the downside. <clears throat> and for me, it's just, the book part is just a fun goal thing I have right now. It's like, like I said, maybe I have 60,000 words and nothing happens, but it was probably a cathartic, cool thing. I'll have a a lot of words on the worst part of my life and it probably feel good after. I mean, honestly, like I said to you before, in the modern era, you're actually, there's the traditional publishing route, mm -hmm. but you are in 100% control as to whether or not it yeah. actually sees the light of day. Well, I'm also a dumbass. <clears throat> I'm not a writer. I've never written before. But you're writing, so guess yeah. what you are now. Yeah, true. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's residual bad self talk, I think, to be like people think it's fucking stupid if I self limiting. If I say, yeah. Which I'm leaning into it. I'm cool. I'm cool with that I think that. I just push it aside and I just keep doing it at yeah. this point. Like what other goals do you have for yourself in life? Dude, literally, like I said, I want to be the best husband and father I can be. When I show up, to this by the way, this is all gonna blow people's minds if anybody at work hears about this. Because when I go to work, <laughs> I am a head down, do my fucking job the best I can. I'm not a small talk kind of guy. In your cubicle, yeah. Have you ever? How many people are in your cubicle area? So there's like, well, in our office building, there's like probably sixty people. In my exact cubicle, there's eight of us that do exactly what I do. Half of those people know my outside of the work personality. For the most part, I'm kind of a head down all about business when I'm at work kind of guy. So the people that pass me in the lunchroom, if anybody happens to listen to this, they're going to be very confused what my extracurricular activities are. <laughs> Have you ever considered starting a mutiny inside of your cubicle cell? No. Just think about it. You don't have to, don't think too hard about it now. I'll tell it. you what I do afterwards too. I was just, I'm trying to keep the personal yeah. stuff broad and just keep it on this, but I've never worked in a cubicle setting, but we used to, uh, we used to talk about this all the time. What would happen Let's just say the way that we <clears throat> communicated with our friends at my old job was in no way, shape, or form socially acceptable. <laughs> it was in no way, shape, or form positive. It was all based in love, but it was like a fucking piranha tank, and God help you if a drop of blood came into that. Oh, yeah. And so we would talk about, do you think a, a large company like IBM would ever let us come work at their office and just d drop 16 of us? <laughs> in a cubicle setting, how long would it take for us to completely hijack the culture and start a mutiny from our nucleus in the cubicles? I think you'd probably call that 30 seconds out. <laughs> I think it would take a while. And I think that there would be some, uh, 
there would be some damage along the way. We might have people running full speed at the windows because nobody is used to being talked to the way that we used to talk to each other. Dude, so the funniest part about it, like, so I work in a cubicle, never thought in a million years I would. I've had a bunch of different jobs. I went to lineman school to be a power lineman, uh, graduated a pretty premier one. It was four months long, lived there, did it every day. That was the goal. Came out, still didn't have my CDL yet, commercials driver's license. Was paying off the student loans and had not finding work yet. <laughs> so I ended up applying for my current job to make money to pay the loan off while I tried to find work as a lineman. Then life happens. Meet my wife. Then I'm traveling. Then it's like, oh, this is getting pretty serious. No more traveling. What can I do internally at work that's local? Got this job. And it's great. I mean, it's really is great. I just never thought I'd be in a cubicle. And like what I told you earlier is I'm for the first time and it happened like two years ago, I'm like, okay, I'm pretty okay with that because of what it provides me Mm -hmm. and realizing how much I can do outside of it. Like I could easily be like, I'm working in a cubicle and I never thought in a million years I would. Do you ever think that working in that job might be limiting you from other opportunities as well? And I am in no way trying to talk you out of that. I ask because I've fallen into this. It's the sunken cost fallacy. Mm -hmm. You've invested so much time into it that you've, that, and by you, I'm just talking about the any individual. Mm-hmm. Um, and a lot of times you'll – this happens with military members. They say, if you, if you do 10 years, you got to do 20. Yeah. Like, that's arguably one of the dumbest things I've ever heard. Mm-hmm. But So if I do 10 years in one day, I yeah. need to do nine years and 364 more <laughs> yeah. because I'm technically closer to retirement than I am starting. And I don't begrudge no, 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 for yeah. doing that. Yeah. But in doing so – what if you missed a bunch of opportunities that would make what you were doing at that point seem trivial because of where you would arrive? I get what you're saying. I'm it's more, a thought experiment. No, no, no. I so I, I, and I got an answer for it. So I, that's, it just comes back to what I was saying. Like, I don't just subscribe to that. It's limiting because I'm here talking to you on a podcast in Montana and I work in a small cubicle. <clears throat> I'm all about how much can I do in those windows? Yeah. And I'm going to go hard in the paint in those windows and see what I can do to me. I'm just proving to myself. I can do more than I even thought just by being here. How is your retirement calculated? Is it age or time in? Um, or maybe both. It's just, it's a 401k. Like oh, okay. A, yeah. Yeah. So you could so call, tell my, you, you could, could call as whenever much you want. As you want. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And, and, and for all I know in 15 years, I'm not okay with it. And I'll branch off for right now with my kids being young, I am perfectly okay with doing it. Like, I'm at peace with that because I know I can do some cool shit in between. And then maybe I won't feel like that in five years and I'll pivot and try to do more or less or I don't know. How do you view your job? Do you think of it as just a job? Do you view it internally as a career? I used to think about it as just a job. That's part of the framework thing as I, I, I picture it. I respect it now and appreciate it more from what it gives me. It's a great company. Love the people. Um, it just, I mean, I love my house. I love my car. I love everything it provides me. I, it would take me a long time to drop that just because I wanted to go work for myself. I still don't know what I want to do with my life. So for the meantime, welcome to the club. Yeah. For the meantime, I am completely happy with going to a nine to five and being the best dad and husband I can be. And then doing some cool shit outside of it. I only ask that because, uh, when I was in New York, I was specifically talking at an organization that helps veterans transition out. It was called Higher Heroes USA. <clears throat> and they were doing their annual fundraising dinner. And I spoke for 30 minutes, um, a little bit about my military experience, and then talking about the experience of leaving the military. And, I was, and it got me thinking a lot about the cohort of veterans that do struggle leaving the military and finding the next whatever it mm-hmm. may be. And it got me that got me thinking about the way I internally – think about my old job and the way that I would vocalize it. And I found that I, that I used to use the word and I'm going to try not to use it anymore. Career, my military career. And I, the more that I'm thinking about it, I'm trying to, the word I want to use in the future is my military experience because for whatever reason, career has this sense of rigidity associated and identity associated with it. And I think that's a lot of what people struggle with. And this is just me talking about my own internal thoughts. I'm not saying anybody should talk about anything in any way, shape or form, but the less 
self-limiting that I think you can be, the more potential that you will see. And if you start looking at something as what you do as your experience, Mm -hmm. not your career and who you are, I think it can help. It's not going to like move the needle from zero to 100, but it might move it enough that it'll get you to shift the way that you think about what is possible. Yeah. Because saying, oh, I was a firefighter. Yeah, my firefighter career. Well, what about your firefighter experience and your career doesn't, you know, Yeah, that'll limit you from having another one for a lot of people. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's just something that I was thinking about and just I'm actually going to try to avoid in the future using the word career with my military time mm-hmm. and just look at it through the lens of my military experience. Just for my own, for my own reduction in that self-limiting verbiage. Yeah. No, that's great. Maybe. I'm, or maybe I'm a fucking moron. Dude. Clinically, I've been diagnosed as being a moron many times. Dude. So Michael's seen it almost every day. Then we so. have the same. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> I just think I could easily fall into the most people. They wake up. They're like, oh, man, is this just what it's about? Go to work. Come home. No, it doesn't have to be. Pick a goal. Try it only it. has to be if you voluntarily participate in that. Yeah. And I just – I think – there are so many more opportunities out there than people are willing to give them credit for. Mm -hmm. And by me saying that doesn't mean that I'm saying it's easy to find those things or that you're going to be successful. The list of things that I have fallen flat on my face on (laughs) since leaving the military, robust. (laughs) Quite a large column in comparison to the successes. Most of the stuff that I do is fucking accidental. I accidentally met Evan Hafer at the SHOT Show and we hit it off. I accident well, I mean, accidentally over the course of many years, a shit ton of meetings, opened up a coffee shop. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> if you would ask me when I was seventeen, would I ever have a coffee shop? First, I didn't have my first sip of coffee until I was like twenty eight. Because I had, uh, take that back. You didn't when you were in. You never. I did. Well, so I had a sip of my mom's coffee, and it tasted like what I think a sweaty hobo's asshole would have tasted like. <laughs> yeah. So it turned me off. I'm like, I don't understand this. <clears throat> my late twenties, a buddy of mine. Drug dealer, essentially, <laughs> gave me a chocolate mocha or an iced mocha, yeah. chocolate mocha. You're like, what is this? First off, it tasted <laughs> like a milkshake, felt like crack cocaine. What? I mean, why would you not want that? And then so for years, that's what I would have. I would have yeah. a, a mocha. And then now I'm at the point where I could put my face underneath that espresso machine. Just, bah, just. Dude, I think I'm up. <laughs> I'm not exaggerating. I, I, a low day would be 300 milligrams. It goes up to it's four. It goes up to four normally. Those are rookie numbers. You can are do you more than that. Holy oh, yeah. shit. I own a coffee shop. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> For the first few weeks we were open, I would lay in bed at night and wonder why I couldn't sleep. <laughs> and then I realized I'm having too much of our own product. I did not you get really coffee because it. we came here. I drank one already. I'm like, I almost went for another one. I'm like, no. I've What's had- the worst case scenario? You know? shit myself on the podcast. <laughs> I mean, it's not live. You can go to the bathroom anytime you want to. Dude, my, my whole caffeine thing was like before kids, I'd do like energy drinks maybe two, three times a week. Never coffee. I liked coffee. I'd get it every now and then. And had kids. I was like, oh, we need to up this. Yeah. So I was doing too much energy drinks and then I go, okay, these are bad. If I'm going to do caffeine, I might as well do it from a like healthier standpoint. So I Coffee. What's in monsters? What I understand is totally natural. Yeah, is it just water and like natural like? I caffeine? can totally pronounce everything that's on the back <laughs> of that can. So it, it went from that to okay, if I'm going to do natural caffeine, let's go coffee. And then when I went coffee, I go, who am I going to use? Black Rifle. Obviously, I'm hearing about it all the time. So proud member of the ECS Evans yep. Coffee subscription. And he, I've actually yeah. run that by him. I said, hey, why doesn't he change it? He supports it <laughs> because I had been doing ad reads, and he mentioned the. What is it? Executive coffee? I said, oh, fuck, dude. I'm sorry. I've been saying that's Evan's coffee subscription. He goes, oh, I like that better. better. <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't give a shit. As long as it drives people in that direction, he doesn't Dude, care. it's great. How do you make your coffee is the question. Because that's actually what I've come to like more than anything is the – Yeah. I like the whole affair, the whole to-do. So I do too now. My wife hates me. I'm a coffee nerd now. So it's the – it's the – um Chemex on the yep. weekends when I have plenty of time. Yeah. On the weekday, we have portable pods um, for a Keurig, which isn't ideal, but I put the Black Rifle coffee in the in you, the reusable. Do you know K-cup. what would make that better, though? 
Take the Keurig and throw it in the fucking garbage because <laughs> that's trash. So if you're not doing a Chemex, I thought you wake up at four forty-five. What the fuck are you doing I'm working with your out. time? I don't have time for a coffee. <laughs> really, you're working out for two hours. It should take you six minutes to no, make a pour. No, then I got to get the girl up, take her to daycare. It's it's a lot. You should wake up at four thirty. I'll go three thirty, and we'll make time. <laughs> it should take you six minutes to make a fucking cup of coffee on a Chemex. Yeah, I guess whenever I make one on the weekend, I'm making a liter. A liter of cola. <laughs> I'll take a liter yeah. cola. It's for I a make cop. One, I make one liter. <laughs> I make one liter on the Saturday. Michael, what movie is that from? I have no clue. Have you ever seen Super Troopers? Nope. Actually, yeah, I don't think so. Okay. I went and got your fucking book, 1984. <laughs> you need to go home tonight and watch Super Troopers, the first one. Dude. And then you'll understand, because you have one, what a mustache ride is. <laughs> okay, fine. Yeah. That's pretty good I probably homework. won't do yeah. that. You're, you you would be highway hog for sure. It'll make sense also once you watch the movie. So are you, are you doing a heroic dose of mushrooms this week? <laughs> <laughs> After this podcast, I think never. I will never do that. See, dude, and that's another thing too. Like, I don't want people to think I'm demonizing. Like, I do think there's a place and it could do good. I just want to serve as a warning to what educated and happen. informed decisions. Yeah. I think are the key. If you are uh, an adult, and let's be honest. The age of 18 may not be the best threshold for being an adult for yeah. most people. However, I understand the legality. If you are a consenting adult, make the choices you want to in life, but all choices have consequences. Yeah. And you can mitigate and manage risk by educating yourself and at least know what the fuck you're getting into. Yeah. I don't think anybody between 17 and 23 should be messing around with it. I mean... It's wild. The, you could fight me on that, but if they say your brain's not fully develop, developed, let's not put in... Mind-altering substances. Mind-altering substances. Like, that should be step one. Do it after your brain's done developing. Well, people will fall back on, you know, stuff like alcohol. Yeah. You know, which is also mind altering. Mm -hmm. And maybe I've had some psychedelic experiences. I mean, drinking two bottles of whiskey in one night could be considered a psychedelic experience. But <laughs> I don't think my brain's functioning when I do that. <laughs> yeah, totally. What do you want to close it out with, man? Um. So people should try to set some goals and achieve them. If you want better mental toughness and just achieve stuff, there's stuff out there that can help you do that. I mean, are you familiar with Andy Frisell in first form? And yeah. Have you heard of 75 hard? Yeah, I do 76 hard. <laughs> Michael, not that kind of hard. <laughs> yeah. Who? I mean, 75 are rookie numbers. So I did that last year. It was one of the coolest things I could do. Like, it just kind of proved to me what I thought and just put a lot of stuff into perspective. Cause during that I wasn't drinking. I did 75 days, which was probably the longest I'd gone without alcohol. And that was part of a much bigger program. Yeah. But search for stuff like that. Pro like try to prove to yourself, you can do more than you think you can do. That for me was huge. I got done with that and I kind of was like, Oh, I'm, I'm more capable even than I thought. So let's just keep going down exploring this rabbit hole. And it, that was one of the coolest programs I could ever do. And I think closing out, is yeah, if anybody out there feels like that, go get help. I don't care how embarrassed you are. There's ways out of it. Just go get help. Like it's, it's so stupid to be embarrassed. It's such a dumb thing. I mean, it, the mask thing we were talking about was pure pride. Like it was just, I was embarrassed and ashamed of what happened. And I was so prideful that I couldn't imagine telling anybody. That's stupid. Just Rough, tell yeah. somebody. Like, and, and if you can't tell your parents or your brother or somebody, try to find somebody that you think you could confide in. Like, if you know somebody who has openly admitted their their past mental health struggles, maybe just go run it by them. Even if it's, oh, I have a buddy. I know he went through some shit. Go have a drink with him and just start just barely admitting some stuff baby steps and just try to go get help try to admit it just let it out there quit being embarrassed don't put a mask on life's short dude like I want to do some cool shit while I'm here yeah. oh closing statement the top comment because I'm sure somebody out there is trying to figure it out I sound like Dane Cook we can leave it at that you do sound silly, dang, dude. <laughs> I've had a million strangers in my life tell me that. 
walk up to me, dude. I thought you were Dane Cook. <laughs> All right. There's worse. Like people tell me, I look like fucking Scott Stapp <laughs> from Creed. From Creed. <laughs> which, first off, his music fucks. Okay. If you don't like Creed, dude. There's the people who say that they like Creed, and then there's the people who say that they hate it and listen to it in their fucking closet. I think they're back, right? They are talking about going on a reunion tour. You know who loves you have your tour tickets? <laughs> Michael, do you know who loves Creed? Denver and Jack Osborne. Oh, really? If they do a reunion tour, do you want to come with us? Absolutely. Name one Creed song. Yeah, go fuck yourself. Not about <laughs> Can't name a single one? We're no, get your fingers off that keyboard, you son of a bitch. <laughs> Higher power. <laughs> you just Higher power. It. Higher is one of their songs. Power. You're not involved. Oh, anymore. actually, yeah. Can you take me? Yeah, yeah that one. <laughs> yeah. That you guys were making fun of the voice. No, but really, thanks, man. You're not invited anymore. Thanks for having me. Like, this yeah. was once-in-a-lifetime bucket list shit. That's what I'm after. This has been an awesome experience. Well, let's hit open, Matt, up tomorrow, 4 to 6. Yeah, we'll do. Cool. Done. Cool.